Good morning and welcome to the second day of the Organic Congress. Uh, today we will have two sessions. Uh, the first session will be on climate mitigation and sequestration in agriculture uh, sector, what is the right level of ambition. And then later we will have a session on towards more sustainable food systems. But first I have a few uh, technical points for you, dear audience. Uh, this is an interactive event and it's very simple for you to participate. On the right side of the live stream under the session, uh, you can see either chat or Slido as well and uh, people and Twitter. So you can chat between the participants via the chat function. However, do not use the chat function to ask questions to the speakers. If you want to ask questions to our panelists, you will have to use the Slido function. And as you can see, it is divided between the Q&A on the one end where we can ask questions to the speaker and in the polls sections where speakers will interact with uh, the audience uh, via polls and we will have a question for you very soon as well. You can also see the list of participants and connect to like-minded people uh, through the chat as well. Uh, do not forget that you can follow this event in two languages, either in English or in Portuguese, and you have to go to the stages section of a platform to choose your preferred language. And if you are experiencing any technical issues, uh, you can address them in the chat and someone from our uh, wonderful organizational team will uh, assist you. But without further ado, uh, let's go into the topic. This morning, we will discuss one of the defining uh, challenges and issue of all times, which is climate change. And as you know, the international community adopted the Paris Agreement, uh, which has a goal to reach carbon neutrality by the middle of the century. And there are many pieces of European legislation that uh, um, are working uh, towards uh, this goal. We will not go into details now about that but as you know the European Union has raised its ambition uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55 percent uh, by 2030 and we are expecting uh, new legislative initiatives in the coming weeks uh, to make this a reality but it's fair to say that up until now the agriculture sector has been left off the hook in these discussions on uh, on climate change for several reasons it's true that in agriculture, we're talking about biological emissions, which you know are, are a bit more difficult to reduce and are partly linked as well to, to the livestock sector uh, too. But at last, now there are plans on the European Commission side to ensure that agriculture contributes with a carbon farming initiative, which aims at encouraging carbon sequestration in soils. Because yes, on the one hand, the agriculture sector, like our sector, emits greenhouse gas emission, nitrous oxide and methane, but in theory it can also store more carbon in soils. I say in theory because we know that some intensive agriculture practices lead to soil degradation and loss of carbon instead of soil carbon sequestration. And the organic movement has always been very clear that agriculture should be part of a solution and should contribute to reducing emissions but uh, carbon sequestration in soils is also a strong point of organic farming and of agroecology practices through longer crop rotation or the introduction of, of legumes in the crop rotation uh, as well. But at the same time, is it really realistic to expect that agricultural emissions be reduced to zero or be fully compensated by carbon sequestration? So in other words, what is the right level of ambition for the agriculture sector? Some experts say that adaptation should be the priority as farmers are already confronted to the impacts of climate change. But let's not forget that we are also facing a collapse of biodiversity and uh, uh, a sterilization of our countryside to, to a large extent. I mean, you know the figures about the disappearance of insects and birds uh, in Europe, and uh, this is largely due to intensive agriculture practices, you know, to loss of habitats, but also to the use of pesticides such as neonicotinoids. So if we frame all the debate on how to make agriculture more sustainable around carbon and greenhouse gas emission, there might be a risk that we end up promoting even more intensification of agriculture and a greater use of pesticides and fertilizers, which are part of a problem in the first place. So once again, what is the right level of ambition 
and how to ensure that climate action in the name of a struggle to prevent dangerous climate change also contributes to preserving biodiversity. And are carbon markets the right policy tool for that? These are the complex issues that we will try to unpack with our panelists uh, this morning. But first, I have a question for you, uh, dear audience. Uh, and you will have to answer through the Slido function of a platform. And the question is, what is the share of agriculture emissions at the global level? Is it 10%, 25% or 80%? And so, while um, you will be answering these questions, uh, I will have a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the speakers uh, to you. And our first speaker uh, today is uh, Christian Osleitner from the European Commission. Christian is Head of Unit for Land Use and Finance for Innovation at the Directorate General for Climate Action. So, DJ Klima, in other words. Christian, good morning. Hi, good morning, Eric. Good morning, all. Thank you for being with us. Where are you calling us from? From Brussels. Yes, like many of us. Well, thank you for joining and we're looking forward uh, to hearing from you what the Carbon Farming Initiative is about. Our next speaker will be Pierre-Marie Aubert from the Institut du Développement Durable et des Relations Internationales. Uh, who is a senior researcher and also the lead of a European Agriculture Initiative at IDRI. So, good morning, Pierre-Marie. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, all. Where are you joining us from on your side? Uh, I'm, I'm in Paris, back, back to the office after the crisis, which is good. <laughs> okay, very good. So, thank you very much as well uh, for joining. We also have with us uh, Thomas Lege from the European Climate Foundation. Thomas is the director for the Land Use Program of the European Climate Foundation. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, everybody. So, are you joining us from Brussels as well? Yes, I'm calling from home. Still only partly allowed back into our office. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have with us uh, Chef Ali Sharma, the director of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, uh, the IATP. So, Shifali, where are you calling us from on your side? Good morning, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm calling from Washington, D.C., which is, it's 4 a.m. here. <laughs> I'm usually yes. based in Berlin, in Germany. So, thanks a million again for joining us today uh, and for being brave enough to participate to this panel at 4 o'clock uh, in the morning. And we also have with us uh, Kurt Sanen. Kurt is the chair of the IFOAM Organics Europe uh, Farmers Group, but Kurt is also an organic farmer, an organic livestock farmer, uh, and he's done many things in his life before being a farmer. He worked in the government uh, at the Belgian level as well, as well as for NGOs. Uh, good morning, Kurt. Good morning, how are you? Very well, thank you. Where are you calling us from on your side? I'm calling from my farm, which is, uh, well, uh, 60 kilometers in the north of Brussels in Belgium. Um, it's called here Molenstede, something with a mill, a place with a mill, but the mill has gone already for centuries. And it's a beautiful farm, I can testify of, of that because I had the chance to, to visit it several times. So thank you, Kurt, uh, for joining us. Uh, but now I think it's time uh, for us to see what you replied to our questions about the share of agriculture emissions at the global level. Can we see the, the results of a poll? <coughs> okay. Well, okay. I don't see the, ah, yes. Okay, well, it was a bit of a chop because there are two correct questions. At the global level, agricultural emissions are officially of 10% because it only accounts for the direct emissions, methane and nitrous oxide. But indeed, if you take into account all the land use changes linked to agriculture and food production, for example, deforestation 
or changes in land use, then estimates are between 25 and 30 percent of the emissions linked to, to agriculture. So these are the two correct answers. Um, and the 80 percent figure refers to, to the share of agriculture land at the global level, which is used for animal production or for the production of animal feeds, which I think is a, is a relevant aspect in this whole discussion. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to go to our first speaker now. Uh, so Christian Osleitner from the European uh, Commission. And uh, Christian, um, maybe uh, you can explain to us what are the plans of the Commission to ensure that the agriculture sector will contribute um, to, to being part of the solutions to address climate change and specifically what is the Commission's carbon initiative about? Yes, sure. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, to, to quickly talk about what, uh, what is our plan here in Brussels at the European Commission. Um, our big target is climate neutrality in 2050. So we want to be the first continent that on balance doesn't emit any more uh, greenhouse gases. So, and to get there, of course, we have to phase out fossil fuels significantly. And then when you think about it, what will climate policy in 2050 be about? It will be about the bioeconomy because the biggest emitter or the biggest emissions will come uh, from the use of fertilizers from livestock. And that together with the remaining fossil fuel emissions must be offset with, with the CO2 that we take into our soils, our forests, but then also like in the products, in the long-lived products that we have from the, from the biomass, like construction material. So what we need to do is, of course, we really need to bring down these fossil fuel emissions. But on the other hand, we really must get to a stronger and more sustainable bioeconomy. And this you will also see in, um, in our proposals that are coming out on July 14th, uh, as you already referred, the, the Fit for 55 package. Um, to give you maybe there a little bit of an idea what we, what we are thinking about uh, agriculture, forestry, so the land sector in, in large. Um, if we look at uh, the CO2 emissions from, from land use forestry, uh, currently uh, in the EU, we take in each year around 260 million tons of CO2 in soils, forests, harvested wood products. So we think this we can increase to around 300 million tons per year by 2030. Then we see, of course, also quite a potential to reduce the non-CO2 emissions from fertilizer, from, uh, from livestock. So around 20% until 2035. Uh, of course, more efficient use of fertilizers, uh, precision farming or other methods. I think what, what we will also talk, uh, talk about uh, today, other farming methods will be important and can, can deliver this. So one could say then by 2035, we would have a climate neutral land sector. So if we compare by 2035, the emissions that we would have from livestock, fertilizer, would be about equal to the carbon removals from, uh, from the land. So we could say by 2035, we can have a climate neutral production of our food and our biomass. So I think that would be, I think, a nice, a nice challenge for the sector to, to reach this. So what we are doing now here in Brussels is we are working at two levels. So the first one, as I said, 14th of July, our Fit for 55 proposals, that will give the overall framework. So the member states targets for, for the LULUCF regulation, for the land use, the targets uh, also for agriculture that's currently still in the effort sharing. Uh, regulation. So we want to put out there uh, a better governance framework for member states so that member states have the right incentives uh, to go there, to do more policies in the land sector, to better support the land sector. But then we are also very keen uh, to really go down to the level of the actors, of the farmers and foresters. So how can we offer a new business model better financial incentives 
for farmers and foresters who adopt more climate friendly practices. So that really the action can happen that we need to reach our, our ambitious targets. So, and here we have two, two initiatives uh, uh, at the start. The one is what you refer to as carbon farming. And that's a bit of a bottom-up approach. So we want to look around, and we've already looked around, in Europe, what are the existing initiatives so that give uh, additional financial incentives for those land managers that adopt more climate-friendly uh, practices. So we've already done uh, a study with the help of consultants. We've published a handbook uh, where we looked uh, like at rewetting of peatlands, agroforestry, uh, grassland, uh, whole farm audits, uh, soil carbon, and, and so on. And based on these experiences, our consultants have drawn um, lessons learned. So what need, do you need to do if you're a regional authority, if you're a private organization, to, to build up, to put in place such carbon farming? Um, initiatives. And, and what we see, of course, the first important thing is, okay, you need a good feasibility study. Yeah? You need to understand what is the potential on, on your parcel of land uh, for, climate, for climate mitigation. Um, then you need to think about, about the monitoring, reporting, verification. So can you really show that you permanently store an additional ton of carbon in your soils and your forests? So what we see here is uh, like rewetting of peatlands. There are several initiatives have developed already very good methodologies, very credible. So they've already gone quite far in developing their uh, business model. And they are selling their credits on the market, uh, I think partly at, at very good, uh, good prices. So mostly to other, to other companies that, um, uh, to, to offset their emissions, like big airlines and, and so on. So that, that, that's a business model. Um, then we see, of course, uh, with other forms uh, like soil carbon, that we still need a lot more of research. So I think there's something that also, uh, that's a task for us with our Horizon program, that we support that better, that we get a better understanding on, on that. Um, we, we've also seen uh, uh, public initiatives, member states uh, thinking about setting up uh, such result-based payments. Uh, we've put out recommendations for the CAP strategic plans, what member states could do. We see a large interest in there. Uh, we have a discussion uh, with them, what can, what can happen there. So but I think really the important uh, points are there. How can we get the to better knowledge, to better advisory services for, for the farmers? Uh, how can we get to better monitoring, reporting, uh, verification? Uh, how can we better uh, see who's interested in buying these carbon credits on our voluntary carbon markets, maybe on regulated uh, carbon markets? So there could be a large demand uh, from the airlines because they agreed on this uh, offsetting, offsetting scheme. Uh, but then also to look, what could be the role of the common agricultural policy? What could be the role of state aid? How can we design better incentives here, also in the public sector? And so that's for me one of the big questions, to better understand uh, like which business model fits, uh, uh, fits well. So, and based on that knowledge, we, we take it a step further and we want to do what we can do best as the European Commission, we want to regulate. So our ambition is to develop uh, an EU-wide standard for the certification of carbon removals. So that we really get um, to a standard of very high credible quality that certifies, okay, if you do this and this, you can show that you've stored one additional ton of carbon in your soils, forest, harvested wood products. And you can earn an extra income on, on that, be the income from private markets, be it based on, uh, on public, uh, public incentives. 
So, and there, of course, as I said, the important questions are the additionality, permanence, but also the links to biodiversity and so on. How can we bring that together with ecosystem services and, and so on? So that's a discussion that we want to have over, over the next months, the next year. We will do an impact assessment on, on that. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to having a very interesting discussion on that. And uh, from our side, we are very open to understand, to learn what could, uh, what could work. So on the one hand, we want to kickstart all of these developments. But on the other hand, we also want to work at a good regulatory framework for, for the next decades. So post 2030 towards uh, 2050, that we can give the right incentives there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for this introduction. So uh, we can expect a lot of initiatives uh, linked to this carbon farming initiative. I already have a follow-up question for you, a clarification question, actually. I mean, you, you say that um, you, know, you, you foresee an ambitious objective to reach neutrality in the agriculture sector already by 2035. Um, uh, thanks to carbon sequestration. But just to clarify about carbon sequestration, we're talking about um, uh, sequestration in agricultural soil, but mostly uh, in forests as well, which are a big thing in Europe. Is that correct? Yes. 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 We look, what we want to do is we want to look at the whole sector and really also see the, the interaction between the different land uses and uh, have a more comprehensive approach than uh than we have now okay i think it was important yeah. to make it clear for for our audience uh as yes, well. yes, so, yes 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 so, so but i as and, and as i said like if you if you talk about agroforestry and and such uh, such approaches you get immediately the link between uh between the different uh land use categories indeed so thank you once again for setting the scene uh, for these discussions we are uh, um uh, right, uh, um, in the, we, we've entered already the, the, the key topics, and now I will turn to uh, Pierre-Marie, Pierre-Marie Aubert uh, from IDRI. I mean, uh, Pierre-Marie, IDRI is, um, is uh, well known now for uh, your groundbreaking work on policy scenarios for a transition to agroecology uh, by 2050. Um, and in this context, you also made an evaluation, you know, of what could be uh, the, the reduction of emissions from the agricultural sector as well. So uh, what is basically uh, Idris' view on the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through a transition to agroecology by 2050? And what would be the specific contribution of soil carbon sequestration uh, in this context? Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric, uh, and thanks, uh, Christian, for the very, very um, great uh, introduction to, to that topic. I would say that at Idri, our starting point wa was not climate per se, but was uh, really like what would uh, a truly multifunctional food system look like, which is within planetary boundaries uh, on all environmental aspects. And, and I would say that we started in a way by biodiversity rather than by climate, which does not mean that we did didn't look at climate, but our starting point was to say, uh, in many cases, when you do something for climate, it can be detrimental to biodiversity, while the other way around uh, does not, well, we don't have experience showing that. So we thought it was a, a best option to start with biodiversity, knowing that whatever we will do for biodiversity will be beneficial for climate. Uh, and the other way around is not, is not, uh, is not true uh, again. So we, we, we designed a, a fully agroecological scenario for Europe, which we model the impact it would have on land use and production and food security, and ultimately on climate mitigation potential and climate adaptation potential, of course. From a purely climate mitigation potential, um, the uh, outcomes of such a scenario, which well, I should say a few words about it, the scenario rely on a, a, a series of assumptions, which basically, uh, can, explain, can be explained as follow. Uh, one, fertility management at a very local level, which means phasing out soybean import and uh, reintroducing legume sedimentation and reconnecting crop and livestock system. Two uh, is the extensification of cropping system with the phasing out of pesticide. Three is the extensification of livestock production um, to increase animal welfare 
and uh, be able to reconnect the crop livestock system and at the same time maintain permanent grasslands for all the ecosystem services they render to uh, to, to agroecosystems and beyond. Uh, four is the adoption of uh, well-balanced and healthy diets. And five is the priority given for the use of biomass to food, then biodiversity, then feed, and then ultimately for um, um, uh, biomass, other non-food uses, I would say. Uh, so with that scenario, we get to a potential of a GHG reduction of uh, 45% compared to 2010. Uh, and the bulk of the reduction comes from uh, the, the, the reduction in N2O emission uh, associated to the strong reduction in uh, nitrogen fertilization. And also uh, from the fact that when you have uh, a shortage in, in nitrogen on agricultural soils, you have more efficiency in taking up that nitrogen by plants. So the, the NUE, so the nitrogen use efficiency of such a scenario is much higher than the current situation. Um, and on top of those 45%, 46% exactly, but doesn't matter the, the one, one percent, on top of that, there is a strong potential for carbon sequestration in soils, both in grasslands, but limited, and in cropland, and in agroecological infrastructures, uh, which are hedges, ponds, uh, wetlands, etc., which are uh, scattered in the uh, actual landscapes. That potential we estimate it based on literature around uh, 100, 150 tons per year, uh, but only if all the measures, all the, the systemic uh, propositions we made in, in the scenario will be adopted simultaneously, which would never be the case. So that figure is only indicative to have an idea uh, of what could be uh, offset by, by the, 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 the agricultural sector. Yet, uh, when we publish the scenario, and I think it's really important to make that very clear, and Christian already touched that upon a bit, um, there are a lot of questions, or there are a lot of points to be considered when we uh, think about increasing soil organic carbon sequestration. One is that it's not permanent. Two is that uh, there is a saturation point. So at some point, this sink will be full. Uh, and the non-permanence and the saturation question are, of course, intrinsically linked. Because at some point, if you change the practices that have led to increase the soil organic carbon in soils, then you will, you will release that carbon. Uh, and it's not that big. So besides the uh, this assumption we made and the, the, the rough calculation I presented a minute earlier, uh, our colleagues from INHAE in France has just published a very strong study that shows that basically the potential for soil organic carbon sequestration in France in the actual landscapes will be around 30 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year in the next 10, 15 years. Not much than that, which represents roughly 40% of uh, all GHG emission of the agricultural sector, which means that whatever you do, um, one, you have a limited sink in, in soils, and two, you still need to cut a lot in GHG emissions. Uh, I should say here that compared to Christian's figures, we did not consider the forested area, which makes a big difference. So uh, the figures Christian and myself are, 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 are giving are not strictly comparable, I should say. Very important to keep in mind for the, for the audience. Um, so the last point I wanted to say is that uh, in terms of the, uh, um, in terms of policy targets and, and key questions that are associated to carbon farming, if we put it like this, uh, what we did with the French government around the Fair Thousand Initiative, which is a, a great international initiative trying to increase soil and carbon sequestration, we believe that uh, we should not uh, use soil organic carbon as a way to offset other emissions uh, because we run too many risks associated to what I've just said. But at the same time, we should still try to increase as much as possible by the policy incentives that Christian, for example, explained or others to increase that soil organic carbon sequestration rate because it's a very good proxy of the quality of the agroecosystems uh, we have uh, in terms of uh, soil biodiversity, in terms of also adaptation capacity, in terms of capacity to adopt to drought, et cetera, et cetera. So all in all, trying to increase soil organic carbon sequestration is in any case 
a, a, a valid objective, a valid policy objective, but we should not use that as a way to diminish our ambition in the reduction in greenhouse gases emission from the agricultural sector. That, that's more or less the, the, the conclusion. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, uh, all. Thank you very much, Pierre-Marie. Uh, that's very interesting. I and mean, what I take from your first intervention is that uh, first, it's important to, to, to address biodiversity impacts uh, uh, as well, and not only you know, look at agriculture from a greenhouse gas and carbon point of view. And secondly, that we have to be, uh, let's say, cautious and, and, and prudent about the, the potential for carbon sequestration in agricultural soils. And like you said, I mean, the, the sink will come mostly from, from forests, but here as well, there is a debate, as far as I know, uh, on, on, you know, to what extent will European forests remain such a large sink with all the pressures uh, to, uh, to, to, to use wood in particular as bioenergy as well. So that's part of the debate. So thank you, Pierre-Marie, for this first intervention. We will come back to you with, for some more questions during the panel discussion. But now I would like to, to turn to Thomas uh, as well. Hi again, Thomas. Uh, I mean, you, you, re you represent the philanthropy uh, sector and you, you play uh, with the European Climate Foundation a major role huh, in driving uh, action to, to address uh, climate change. The question I want to ask you is, is carbon neutrality the right objective for the agriculture sector from your perspective? Thanks very much, Eric. And indeed, um, I think it's a great question to start with. Um, my answer would be yes, but. There's a big but. Um, so I think, you know, the European Climate Foundation, we're, we're a foundation that is interested in climate change. Um, <clears throat> our um, objective is to push for European action on climate change. So yeah, absolutely. We want to see agriculture do its part, like the rest of the economy, and, and deal with the climate impacts of agriculture. And, and I would definitely agree with, uh, with Christian's framing that, you know, we have to take an integrated view of the whole land use sector. That's why in, uh, in my organization, we don't have an agriculture program, we have a land use program and so on, but we don't have an agriculture program, we have a land use program, because we see this as a really complex, really systemic issue that needs to be addressed as a whole. Um, even still, I would uh, find myself agreeing with a lot of what Pierre-Marie has just said about the need for caution and uh, particularly the risks of taking um, a, a singular focus on carbon abatement. Um, I think he made a very interesting point, which we would agree with. Even though we're a climate organization, we see the risks of, um, of, of impacts on biodiversity in particular by focusing solely on carbon. And um, the reverse doesn't seem to be the case. I think we need to look at the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency as part of a broader systemic emergency that the world needs to approach in an integrated way. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go over or repeat too much as what, what has already been said by both speakers. I agree with a lot of it. Um, I, I would say just to re-emphasize the point uh, that Pierre-Marie made, um, we have to, uh, actually both speakers made, um, we have to figure out how to use land to draw down carbon and store carbon from the atmosphere. That's non-negotiable. We're not going to, um, even under the most optimistic scenarios, we're not going to reach our climate objectives of 1.5 degrees globally um, without some um, form of carbon removal, some form of drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. And we can do that, you know, we can do this with, with technologies like um, carbon capture and sequestration with uh, certain types of bioenergy, although we have some, some issues with that, let's say. Um, direct air capture, these are all possibilities. Um, but yeah, you know, farming, um, land use generally is definitely going to be part of it. And there's a really interesting literature um, and conversation um, developing around the role that natural climate solutions can play. But it's really all about how we design them. Um, and there's, there's kind of concerns about the design of the types of projects themselves, and there's concerns about the design of the governance in which these projects will take place. Um, so I think on the, uh, on the governance, I'll focus on that. Um, we, 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 definitely, um, we definitely need to reduce emissions from the agriculture sector. And Christian has outlined already some ambitious um, uh, targets by the Commission to, to, to drive 25% reductions in, in greenhouse gas emissions from the ag sector. I think that's um, a start. So I think we need to do more eventually, um, but at least there's that. Um, but, um, but we will still have residual emissions left. We won't be able to produce food for the long term, at least, um, or for the medium term, rather, at least, um, without uh, fertilizers and without methane emissions from, from livestock. 
Um, so we've got to figure out ways to do that better and also to figure out ways to um, make our diets less dependent on, on um, you know, meat and dairy, essentially, which is the biggest culprit by far when we look at um, agriculture and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to do this. But should agriculture be, should agriculture aspire towards carbon neutrality? Uh, and by the way, here, I assume we're talking about greenhouse gas neutrality because carbon is only one of the issues. It doesn't capture nitrous oxide, methane potentially, you could say it does. Um, so this is where my yes, but response comes in. Um, I, I have a, a, a bit of a concern that if we talk about the sector of agriculture essentially being, car being carbon neutral or greenhouse gas neutral, when we know that it's actually not going to be possible to reduce all of the emissions from the sector, at least for the next 20 or 30 years, then we're basically saying um, it's, it's, it's carbon neutral if we consider agriculture and the emissions that are, sorry, the, the, the removals that happen within the land use space to be a single unit. And I think that raises some, some concerns and some, some risks um, one of the most important is, and um, a lot of our grantees and partners are really um, emphasizing this point, is that removals are not the same as reductions. Pierre-Marie has made this point, but I think it's worth emphasizing. Um, if we basically say that removals and reductions are the same, well then in theory we could imagine unlimited removals by technology, by better land management practices in the future, and say that we can continue business as usual, knowing that our sins will be forgiven in, you know, through some indulgences program in, in 20 or 30 years with, um, with, some, with, the, with some magical technology, which will take all the carbon out of the atmosphere again. And we know we can't do that. And my concern about a, a, a framing um, that says uh, car uh, carbon neutrality or greenhouse gas neutrality is possible, it basically allows the principle that agriculture can continue to emit and its, its, um, its emissions will be offset. And so there's a whole um, concept of, or, or discussion around net zero, net zero emissions. We have to get there, but net zero does not mean you know, millions of emissions and millions of removals. Net zero has to mean massive, massive reductions of, of our current emissions. And on top of that, removals. And the concern that we would have is that if this is not done right, we would be incentivizing um, essentially business as usual with, uh, with, with, with a, a, a lot of hope that, that removals would be taken care of um, by some other means. Um, and then there's one other last point I just wanted to mention, which is that um, if we agree that removals are possible, do we also agree that those removals should be designated for the agriculture sector, for the food sector? It's actually an interesting question. You could argue that those, those removals, are, they belong to society, and it's up to society to decide how they are most valuably apportioned um, or assigned. And, and I think, um, you know, I've, I've read some, some uh, um, d d commentary or, or ideas in the media, and, I, and, the, and the, the Commission has also said this, that, you know, there was a lot of interest from companies like Microsoft or Amazon to be a source of financing for carbon removals uh, from the land use sector, for carbon farming, rather. Um, but if that's the case, does that mean that we are basically saying same-day deliveries by Amazon are the thing that we are going to use this precious limited sink in the future for? Um, that's an interesting conversation that I think deserves more discussion, let's say. Um, and, and again, you know, it goes back to Pierre-Marie's point. The, the, the sink is limited, it's small, and, we, it's a, and it's, it has to be additional. And so we have to be really careful about, about how we use it. So this is all just the kind of the carbon neutral framing. I haven't really even talked about biodiversity, but maybe that's for a later stage of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. I mean, it, it was very clear. Um, and uh, indeed, there are uh, quite a, a number of points to, to unpack. I mean, it's a very complex discussion as well. But I mean, I think your, your, your words of, of caution on the, you know, the risk of continuing a business as usual approach rather than engage on the trans transformative path uh, is very important indeed. So uh, thank you very much for now, uh, Thomas. And now I want to continue this discussion um, on some points which were already touched upon with Shefali. Uh, hello again, Shefali. Um, I mean, there were many things said already, and I hope, I hope that our audience is still with us because the topic can be a bit complex, but what I want to hear from you uh, is specifically about, um, you know, the, the, the role of carbon markets in this whole discussion. I mean, um, Christian said that, you know, carbon sequestration is about providing more offset possibilities, also in this, you know, framing of carbon uh, neutrality. Uh, I would like to know what is uh, your take uh, on this, and in particular as well, uh, I would like to know 
what's the, uh, the experience of farmers in, in the USA? Because I think you, you told me that there were uh, uh, experiments uh, around uh, the use of carbon markets for soil sequestration as well. So thank you for being with us again. And the floor is yours, Shefali. Thank you again for having me. Um, yeah, I want to start with something that hasn't been mentioned here. And I think it's really relevant in the context of of looking at offsets using the removals as Thomas has talked about for uh, allowing polluters to continue polluting. Um, and that is, what is the impact of rising emissions um, if we don't do the reductions properly and allow a big loophole like offsets uh, on food systems, on food production itself, which I think is quite relevant for farmers. Um, Climate change is already impacting farming systems across Europe with uncertain rainfall, periods of no rainfall, high temperatures, floods. Erratic and extreme weather is expected to worsen with climate change. Studies commissioned by the EU predict increasing droughts, water shortages in Southern Europe, changes in daily temperatures, rainfall and humidity. Hence for agriculture and food production, it is critical that polluters not have loopholes that allow them to continue polluting. All signs indicate that DG Klima is seeking to incentivize carbon credits from land, including soil carbon credits. Yet, as uh, Pierre-Marie um, articulated, there is scientific consensus that soil carbon is impermanent, easily reversible, hard and expensive to measure. So why would we allow Microsoft or Google or Ryanair or Bayer and BASF to offset their own emissions through a so-called asset that is not permanent and highly reversible. What we're essentially doing is saying, you guys can continue polluting while we pretend that there's something that's gonna be permanent that is not permanent. And that's very dangerous for food systems and food production. So as other speakers have indicated, we know the types of agricultural practices that deliver long-term adaptive and holistic benefits to soils. Um, uh, and current and past, uh, um, I mean, we've had practices uh, that increase biodiversity. Um, and there are also quantitative indicators that can show, um, you know, soil and water quality. Um, and, and it's not just about, I mean, I, I agree, Pierre-Marie has said, you know, that um, looking at carbon in the soil allows you to have a sense of soil health. But there's also other indicators um, and including biodiversity indicators. So why don't we start looking at uh, more action-based results, which is what we were doing, instead of the result base that's limited to carbon. I think that's really critical. Um, so what is it? Um, you see an image um, up here on the slide. And so what can we say about the financial model? Um, Christian has talked about using the CAP and national CAP strategic plans to support the um, carbon markets. And what we think is that actually the financial model around carbon markets is actually quite flawed because the bulk of the money uh, goes to carbon consultants and to the operation of the carbon markets. So why wouldn't we use that money directly to help farmers and support transition and also to support farmers that are actually doing the right thing. Um, because the whole key issue around uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification is additionality, as Christian has pointed out. Rightfully so. Farmers should show that they've done something additional. But what about farmers um, that are actually doing the right thing? How do they get supported um, in terms of what they're doing? They're basically left out of the scheme. Um, I can bring up uh, the slide that you see is about the Chicago Climate Exchange. This is what happened in the US uh, between 2003 and 2010. There was a soil carbon market. And at its height, uh, it paid about $4.70 uh, per metric ton. It included 8,700 farmers and landowners and was set and included 17, that, that total 17.2 million acres. But it, uh, collapsed because the price just couldn't meet uh, there. The price just didn't reach. So it was, um, you know, farmers invested in this, but there was, it was not profitable for them. 
Um, next slide. Uh, I also want to bring up uh, in 2008, 2009, the World Bank got together with and with the Biocarbon Fund and established the first ever soil carbon methodology in Africa, in Kenya, called the Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project. It's still going on, but incidentally, before this presentation, I was looking for the actual source documents and it was impossible to find project documents for this. So that's highly problematic. And I will be following up with the World Bank on why there are no project documents, but only press releases and blogs about this project. But we did take a very detailed look at this um, 10 years ago when it first started. And again, this is one of those methodologies where you had 45,000 hectares, 25,000 tons of CO2 sequestered, they've said. Uh, the aim originally was to sequester 150,000 tons by 2025. Um, one of the, the blogs and PR documents said that the World Bank has agreed to pay farmers five US dollars uh, per year. We're talking about per year here. Um, then another document shows that it was 30,000 farmers, 65,000 USD in carbon payments. So when I do that math, I calculate 2.1 USD per farmer, $2. And it said 35% of that money goes to operating costs. Um, two years ago at the UNFCCC, uh, they presented this project and we asked this question about how much do farmers get? And the World Bank representative said, oh, we think it's about 15 US dollars per year. So I guess the highest is 15 US dollars for these Kenyan farmers per year and thousands going to carbon consultants for the monitoring, reporting and verification. And a lot of responsibility in terms of the monitoring and reporting. So I guess the fundamental question for, for, for me and for a lot of the speakers that have outlined, we know what, what the right practices are. We know what needs to happen. We need a holistic approach to agriculture. We need to create biodiversity. We want to improve soil and water quality. That helps sequester carbon and it restores ecosystems. And that's fundamental to, our, to agriculture's ability to adapt, as Eric has pointed out. So why would we put this whole huge apparatus around this only to allow polluters to be able to delay at best and at worst prevent actual real reductions, which is what the world needs to be able to protect our food systems and our food growers. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Chef Fari. I think it's very useful indeed to have this, um, you know, this perspective from uh, projects which have existed on the ground as well. I mean, like you said, uh, the question of when you talk about carbon markets, uh, the question of the price of carbon uh, is a key element of the equation, uh, of course. So, I mean, we'll come back to these aspects. I mean, are carbon markets the, the, the right tool uh, also uh, in the panel discussion? So thank you very much, Chef Ali. And now I want to turn to uh, um, our last speaker in terms of first intervention. And uh, it's uh, uh, Kurt. Kurt, thank you again for, for joining the panel. And uh, I mean, you are an organic livestock uh, farmer. Uh, first, I would like you to, to introduce in these discussions, you know, what from your point of view are, are the benefits of organic farming uh, for the climate, but also for biodiversity. But I also want to ask you if, from your perspective, you know, the, the whole debate uh, on climate change and the contribution of the agriculture sector is, is framed in the right way as well. So I'm aware it's a lot of questions, but please, Kurt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Well, it's, it's a difficult question because it's difficult to explain what are the benefits of organic agriculture, of climate and biodiversity, and even uh, pointing this question is a statement because we combine climate and biodiversity together, which is, of course, very important. So we need to have solutions to the climate uh, uh, and together with solutions for biodiversity. You cannot separate this discussion. So what is this is about? Why do we have a problem with our climate? Why do we have a problem with uh, biodiversity. And that's important to point out these questions because if you want to answer the questions, you need to 
focus on what are the real problems. And reality is that uh, the last few hundred years, we have exposed our economy with our technological and scientific um, uh, intelligence. Uh, we have um, went over the boundaries, the safe boundaries of our planet. I'm referring to um, the Stockholm Resilience Center um, research, pointing out which are the important uh, planetary boundaries. So we need solutions which go to, to, to the, the real bottom of this problem, not end of the pipe solutions. We need to focus on what is the problem. Compare it with uh, if there is a fire, of course, you need to have uh, uh, fire extinguishers, but think about fire prevention, else we will have new fires over and over again if we only have only invest in fire extinguishers. And that's that's what um, our mainstream politics and our mainstream uh, economy is doing is just investing in uh, fire extinguishers. And what's organic farming doing? Organic farming is it's focusing on fire prevention. Why do we have fires? Why do we have a climate problem? Why uh, is there a biodiversity problem? And um, organic farming gives a holistic answer to these very, very difficult and very big questions. Um, how do we do that? Well, because and already said today, because we focus on the fact how farming can be part of the solution to all these uh, problems and not only on the, uh, the troubles. So we need to transition to another agri agricultural paradigm. And this paradigm is agroecology is the way how we in, in organic farming try to um, change uh, a way we talk and we think about farming. And, and all, all this together make that we focus on uh, circular agriculture so we have less inputs uh, and less out negative outputs uh, that we use less pesticides, less antibiotics, less uh, fertilizer. We focus on the soil, how we can use more manure compost to make sure that there is carbon sequestration. Uh, we have more grasslands in our farming systems. We have less animals, of course. Uh, so there are less uh, enteric emissions, less methane emissions from livestock. Organic farming is in reality a real farm to fork strategy because you cannot talk about um, agriculture if you don't talk about what's on your plate and our, all our plates and what we eat. So um, organic gives a systemic answer to all these questions and make sure that in the future we stay be, uh, in the safe boundaries uh, of our planet. And that's, that's very important. This makes that there is a huge responsibility for our governments. Uh, you cannot leave the solution for these planetary questions just to a choice of a consumer saying, oh, I'm buying today organic because I'm so aware of all these problems. It's not a responsibility of consumers. It's a responsibility of us all. So we need to change a lot. We need a, a big transition. And, and I made a, an interesting drawing. I hope uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, old fashioned. So uh, I like drawings. And, um, and it makes clear why and where we should focus on. I hope you can see this some way, somehow. Oh, this is in... Uh, yeah, you cannot read it because it's uh, that's uh, turned around. It's, it's mirrored. But look here, this is the big input in our farming system. These are farmers which are getting bigger and bigger. And every year we have less farms. They produce an output in a long chain for um, the consumer. But it gives a big externality. This is our pollution. This is climate change. This is biodiversity loss. This is uh, nitrogen problems and so on, which again is sold by end of the pipe solutions to have less externalities. These are the commodities. And who are these commodities? That's Bayer, that's uh, John Deere, that are the financial institutions. This is um, Cargill, 
Nestle, Schwarz, that's little, they all have 50 to 70% of the market in pesticides, uh, agricultural infrastructure, in um, retail, and so on. So more than half of all the agricultural um, economical sector is in hand of these five companies. So we need economical instruments to change this because that's a trouble, which is an agroecological way, an organic way of fuel is creating this kind of system. Less inputs, it's, it's logic, isn't this? Farming is the only economical system which only can produce only with water, soil, and sun, you can produce forever all our food. That's the only input you need. Logic, that's what organic farming is doing. So less inputs, a lot of farms, big, small, smaller, but all connected to each other. So they can really have circular farming, which produce less externalities, of course, because less in the system, a lot of circularity is logically less uh, negative impact and they produce a lot of output which can be sold in a short chain directly to the customer yeah who is losing in this system yeah schwarz little john deere financial institutions so you know where the lobby is to withdraw against this transition and where you cannot find the answers so don't ask john deere or uh, schwartz or cargill how we should develop our agricultural system because they will give the wrong answer we need a good answer and that's big responsibility for european community because we need to change our international trade economy is about rules who can access our market and which are the rules to access this market so change this and be uh, clear about that and of course we have our cap a lot of money the biggest amount of uh, the european budget going to farmers putting them in one or another direction and that's now a big disappointment this cap this new cap which is coming on now is just old business and it's not not um, implementing the interesting views we have read in Green Deal in the European Farm to Fork strategy, which was hopeful, but now this is disappointment. So the answer can be in, uh, clear, it's change our international trade, change economical rules and make a good green cap. Thank you very much, Kurt. Well, that sounds like a very good program indeed. And uh, yeah, we had a very intense and interesting session uh, on the CAP negotiations yesterday as well. But thank you for your strong messages, Kurt. And uh, let's start the panel discussion right away. And I already have, I will start with you, Kurt, and since you, since you have the floor, uh, because I mean, you're a livestock farmer, okay? So you're, you're a meat producer, uh, but uh, the share of, of livestock is, uh, you know, in a way, it's, it's part of a problem. Uh, I mean, I've heard the French environment minister say that if we reduce by 10% um, uh, consumption of animal products at the global level, we would be able to feed 1 billion uh, people more. So it's an important element uh, of a discussion. I mean, you represent, as chair of the IFOAM Organic Hero Farmers Group, you know, Organic Farmers Associations. Uh, are you okay with a message that, uh, you know, we need to reduce the consumption of animal products? Can you say a word about that so that we start the panel with, with that, Kurt, please? Yeah, it's obvious. If, if all the world is eating as much um, meat as we do in the West, then uh, one planet won't be enough. That's easy. So, yes, we need to reduce the consumption of meat. Uh, meat needs to be a luxury product sunday meat day choose uh, a very good uh, piece of meat from a very good farmer which is produced in a very good way uh, and then it's right and we need to uh, eat more vegetarian that's i think it's almost obvious um so and and i'm i'm not feeling threatened about this message i give this message to my customers too uh meat is a luxury product and um so we need to change and again this is a message about 
how should we talk about agriculture and 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 uh, about food well it needs to be in looked integrated a real farm to fork strategy with um, a, a good focus on how our agricultural system can ev uh, evolve at, um, in transition to an agroecological uh, farming system okay thank you Kurt. that's good to hear about slow so clearly uh, from an organic livestock farmer. So thank you for that. So now we're starting the panel. I think, I hope that we are all set up and we should all be uh, on screen for this panel discussion as well. Um, I want to turn to you, Christian, uh, because you know a lot has been said and in particular on the need for a, a systemic approach to reduce all the impacts of uh, agriculture. And in particular, you know, what about the impact on biodiversity? So what I want to ask you is, you know, what are your plans to ensure that the carbon farming initiatives also deliver benefits for biodiversity rather than, you know, encouraging a more business as usual approach in the agriculture sector? Yeah, no, no, th thanks for the, for the questions, Eric. Um, this is something we need to look at. Uh, how can we combine the financial incentives for, um, for carbon sequestration with bio biodiversity? Yeah? We, we as, as commission we already ventured a little bit into into this with the green taxonomy on which we will work further the do no significant harm uh principles we will come out um, with uh, with the restoration targets on bio on biodiversity later later this year and i fully agree you have to to see that uh, that together so i mean my prime example is here always um like the rewetting of, of, of drained peatlands. That can be a win-win situation for, for both climate and biodiversity. And then we need a business model to make it work because mm, peatlands, wetlands are, are very much uh, concentrated in, in some small areas of, uh, of Europe, but they are very full power, a uh, very powerful storage of, of CO2, but also, uh, very uh, biodiverse ecosystems. So how can we make a package that, uh, uh, that there we, we turn from more or less from, from peat production into this, this storage of, of CO2? So it's a little bit for me like, uh, or oh, we have this for coal regions, we have this coal regions in transition. One could think about a similar approach for, for peat, uh, uh, peat rich, uh, uh, rich regions. And I think we will, I proposed something on this like in, in our long-term vision for, for rural areas. And I think that would be a good example how for one region you could change the system and it needs to be a win-win situation for everyone, for climate, biodiversity, and for the farmers there. Uh, because, and I think there I, I agree very much with Quit, we really need to think of, I mean, what do we want to do with our land in, in the future? How should our rural regions look like uh, in the future. Also, how do we make them a good place uh, uh, to live? Huh? I mean, we've seen now with COVID and, and so on that people want to maybe be more in the nature, not anymore so much in, in cities. So what can we what can we we offer there? So I think this regional development aspect, I think, is also a very important one that one shouldn't uh, shouldn't forget. Indeed, you're right. Uh, I mean, the preservation of uh, you know ecosystems and, and carbon stocks is very important as well. But to be honest with you, sometimes we have the impression that we're working in silos. You know, in DJ Klima working on carbon sequestration, DJ Environment on biodiversity, DJ Agri uh, on the cap, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, these these are part of the challenges of policy making uh, uh, as well. When we know that what we need to have is a, is a systemic approach, so so hence the importance of these discussions. Uh, like today. I mean, I will come back to you, but maybe um, I would like to hear from uh, uh, Pierre Marie now, um, because I mean, I think there is a real risk which some of you have highlighted that we continue a business usual uh, with a business as usual approach um, through, through actions to prevent climate change in the agriculture uh, sector. Can you add again, Pierre Marie, on in your view, you know? What could be done at the policy level to really ensure that, uh, uh, that, that we address all these issues, you know, climate, biodiversity, uh, soil, health, water quality, landscape, um, 
in this systemic approach also at the policy level. Can, can you say a bit more on that, Pierre-Marie, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, um, I, I believe, and I will, um, I hope there are colleagues from the Agri listening to the call. I believe that the, uh, the, the, the initial idea of having a, a, an eco scheme in the first pillar was probably a good one. The, the, the main problem we have is that we didn't define what, what could be uh, eligible to the, to the eco scheme. And I think we have clear indicators coming from um, agronomy and um, agroecology and uh, ecological landscape about what will be needed, what, will, what do we need to support if we want uh, to get both uh, biodiversity and climate benefits. And when I'm talking about climate, I'm talking about both adaptation and mitigation. And I think what Chef had said earlier is really key to get to take into account in a context where, I mean, we all know how yields have been stagnating and more and more viable, et cetera, et cetera. So we cannot bet anymore on yield increases, but that was more uh, aside from what I wanted to say. So the, the, there are two pillars uh, for an agricultural landscape, which is resilient, biodiversity friendly, and climate friendly. And those two pillars are really simple. We need to reduce, in an absolute point of view, not from an efficiency point of view, the total amount of synthetic inputs that are uh, used in that landscape, both nitrogen and phosphorus, and of course, pesticide. So that's the first pillar. And if we don't put everything on the table to reduce in an absolute term, not in terms of efficiency, how much is poured in the agricultural systems, there's no point we can get to benefits in both from both the biodiversity and the climate perspective. And the second point, the second pillar of a win-win agricultural landscape is the share or the, the level of heterogeneity in the landscape, both in terms of crop rotation and in terms of the share of semi-natural vegetation, which is present in that landscape. And we know from science and a recent publication from, from Garibaldi and colleagues and the work done by Chamco, et cetera, that we need at least 20% of semi-natural vegetation in any landscape if we want that landscape to be resilient, to be biodiversity friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the 10% target in the Green Deal of landscape features. And we know that 10% target might be enough if we also make sure that we have extensively managed permanent grasslands around those 10% of landscape features. But if we only have those 10% landscape features without the permanent grasslands that are extensively managed here and there, we will not reach our biodiversity targets and by the way, uh, th there are clear gains as well if we maintain those landscape features from a climate perspective in terms of sequestration, et cetera. So we have those two pillars. And I believe that if the eco scheme would have been like focusing on those two pillars, there would have been a lot of potential gains to be made in the next few years. But unfortunately, for many political reasons, we all know, or at least we have a sense of, that was that's not what was going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Pierre Marie. And at this stage, I have to to uh, remind our audience that you can ask a questions huh, through Slido, uh, through the, the interface uh, as well. Uh, but maybe just to to follow up very quickly uh, uh, on this. I mean, I think you what you said is very import, important. You know, in the end, it's the absolute emissions. Uh, uh, that matter, and so we should move away from uh, a framing around carbon uh, uh, intensity uh, as well, because yeah, there are agricultural practices that can use pesticide or synthetic fertilizer, which on paper can also reduce emissions as well, but we do not, do not have these benefits uh, um, uh, on biodiversity. Um, so maybe now I can ask a question to, to to Shefali uh, uh, again, um, I mean, you, you said that, you know, maybe the focus should be in finding solutions in the cap uh, as well, like uh, Pierre-Marie said as well, you know, through, through, through vehicle schemes uh, as well. And, and you told us that uh, maybe farmers do not benefit that much from the use of carbon markets uh, as well. So from your point of view, where do you see where the, the, the financing for action in the agriculture sector should come from? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole issue for farmers is, is their predictability in terms of whether they're able to meet, A, their cost of production, 
and then plus make a reasonable profit. And when the problem with carbon markets are is that they're also integrated with financial markets. So you've got speculation there and there's no clear indication with an impermanent asset that you're going to ever have a high enough carbon price. And I think this is what happened with the Chicago climate exchange and it collapsed because it was just, it crashed. Um, I think the, so what, what we are advocating for is yes, public finance, climate finance has to be predictable. It has to incentivize a holistic solution for the transition for, for farmers. And as Pierre Marie said, yes, we had a hugely missed opportunity with this current cap. But 2027 is just around the corner. And, uh, and I think what we need to do is to ensure that the same thing does not happen in 2027 under any circumstances. But I think what we really need to be clear about is this whole notion that the CAP strategic plans should then be used to support the establishment or the further development of carbon markets. And I think that's, that's a problem we need to be able to ensure that the cap strategic plan then also supports uh, this transition in a predictable manner that helps both farmers that are that need to transition but also the the producers that are part of um, organics europe right we we want to reward the farmers that are doing the right thing and so how do we ensure that the cap strategic plans are used where we had a missed opportunity with the overall cap uh, so that we transition towards that. And that if there is going to be climate finance coming in, that that is it actually supporting uh, these objectives and totally agree with you, Eric. Um, you can't have DG Environment doing restoration targets and then having this totally delinked from where we're going with what we propose in agriculture. Uh, we need ecosystem restoration in agriculture as well as forests. And that's the fundamental lens with which we need to look at how do we drive that change? I think it's entirely possible. And because um, the commission is just starting out with their proposal, I'm hoping, uh, Christian, that you're taking in some of this input and that we can work with you to see that we actually deliver on these biodiversity and climate co-benefits together with something that actually works for, for farmers as well. I don't know if that helps answer the question, but yes public financing, predictable financing, not a waste of resources going into um, other consultants, but actually to the producers to get the, the results that we want. Okay, thank, thank you, Chef Ali. And, and I will turn again to Christian, but I think Thomas uh, as well, uh, uh, you wanted to ask a, a question as well to, to, to Christian on uh, you know, how, how to best fund this uh, action in the agriculture sector and in sequestration, Thomas. Yeah, thanks very much. I may not, it may be um, of interest to other panelists too, but I'm, I'm, I was on a, a call a few days ago around the whole issue about carbon dioxide removals. And, you know, the, everybody on the call agreed we have to do this. And everybody on the call agreed that nature-based solutions, nat natural climate solutions, as the acronym is now, will be uh, part of this. But we've talked, we've heard so much about the uncertainty that relates to the, to, to, um, to the carbon flux in the land. It's different if you're, you know, using direct air capture and then locking the carbon dioxide away forever. But with, with, with natural climate solutions, you're dealing with inherent uncertainties, um, both in terms of the amount of carbon stored, the permanence, and the potential side effects, um, such as a conflict between, between carbon and biodiversity. But I'm wondering, I mean, could we not just agree that we need to fund natural carbon solutions, but not worry so much about exactly how much we are getting in terms of tons, but rather think about this as the type of agricultural practices that we need to be promoting for, for, um, for their own benefit, which are good for carbon, good for biodiversity, good for, natural, uh, for local economies and all the rest. And in a way, that's what the CAP should be doing. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we should have a common agricultural policy which provides subsidies, which does all of these things. I think if we could, if that's where the financing could come from, and not so, not worry so much about the exact tonnage, because that is inherently unstable. I just wonder, would that be a, a, a way of kind of balancing these 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 objectives? Christian, do you want to reply to this to these questions? Yeah, I think this is for for me one of the key questions, and I think this is also what we see uh, what we see from um, from the case studies, uh, from from the existing initiatives that we looked. Uh, 
uh, add and that, that the summary is contained in, in our handbook. So do we go on the results or do we uh, reward certain practices? And for rewarding certain practices, the common agricultural policy, I think, has, uh, has, uh, has the tools uh, to do it. So, uh, like on, on soil carbon and, uh, and, and so on. Um, but then I think it's, it's interesting, and, and I think there are others, like as, as I said, the rewriting of feedlands, agroforestry, and so on, that may, may lead themselves better into more result based uh, uh, schemes, be they then financed by private resources or by, uh, by public resources. Um, so I would keep a very open mind on that, and, and we need to have a good, uh, good discussion on that. I mean, my primary uh, concern is how do we get more money to those who do the good things? And that's, uh, that's where we need to, uh, to get to. And I would also uh, would like to say it's uh, with, with soil carbon, eh? Pierre-Marie, I mean, said it very, very differently. We will not save the world. But it is something that we should do. Because I think of what, what we've learned in climate policy, we, knew, we need to do everything to, to get there, to get to climate neutrality. And climate neutrality is only an intermediate milestone. Because ultimately, what we need to do is we need to get the CO2 out of the air. We must restore, again, sustainable carbon cycles. So when we talk about climate neutrality, this is not for us uh, uh, like, like a means in the end. It's, it's an intermediate milestone that we need to have. And of course, we need, and we need to do both things. We need to phase out the fossil fuels, and we need a more sustainable, stronger bioeconomy. We need to do two things, the two things. And of course, then come a lot of questions. How do we find it? How do we get to, to the best... Uh, uh, incentives, but, um, but I think it's not at all our idea to, and it's it's just physically impossible to uh, to use the European land to offset all our fossil fuel emissions. This will not work. Okay. What we want to hmm? what we want to do is to set the better incentives, and I think there are a lot of solutions that are around there for the land, and and I think. What I also want to, to say, it's finally also to, to show the consumers the costs of what, of what they are eating, of what they are producing, and, and so on. And, and for this, uh, we, we, need to, we need to show that, uh, okay, there are the carbon removals, uh, they cost something, so we need to, uh, to pay something. And, and, and I think in this, our intermediate goal of, uh, of saying, okay, the agricultural sector could become climate neutral. I think that that could be an, an attractive proposition around that. We can then better develop the policies for, for this and the next decade, and in particular, as Shefali also said, for, uh, for the next common agricultural policy. Thank you, Christian, for clarifying these uh, aspects. And uh, indeed, I mean, we will need to continue with discussions, you know, on, the, on what's the best approach. I want to take questions from the audience, but Kurt, you, you want to, to react quickly, please. Yeah, because we're talking now about a real important uh, question. And, and uh, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed eh, that, that there is nobody from DG Agri here around the table because they are part of the solution, but also part of the problem, to be honest. Uh, for now, if you look how um, cat money is used, you see that there is a focus on these technological end of the pipe solutions. My farmer, my colleague nearby, is building a new stable with more cows, with uh, cows stay inside, uh, less grassland outside, more maize and filters who put away the enteric emission, the methane emission from his livestock. That's the solution which is now paid by, by cap money. And that's the solution where it's focused on. Why? Because you can measure. You can say this instrument is 5% less, this instrument, this technological solution is 7%, and that's everybody is happy with that. But Organic is not working like that. And Thomas put it uh, the right emphasis on, it's not about, yeah, is this five or five and a half? It's about a systemic solution. And um, I think we have as an organic sector, a big 
responsibility in changing this narrative because the narrative now if we talk about climate is about um the the impact the uh, the uh, total amount of co2 per liter of milk per kilogram of meat and so on and so on with a focus on productivity and so the most productive system is of course best for the climate isn't it but that's a wrong way to 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 to, to talk about this it's about um not efficiency it's about sufficiency not uh, how efficient are we producing something but what do we need and how can we produce this with the less impact on climate and biodiversity um so we need to change the narrative from productivity to production to um end of the pipe solutions to looking to the total impact of our agricultural system to all ecosystems including climate change and i think as an organic sector we all think that uh, this is true this narrative but be sure if you go out of this room and talk to the rest of our society they will say what we say is not true so it's important to change this narrative thank you Kurt. and if i may say i mean I think your concern should not be addressed so much to a commission and DJ Agri on the cap, but uh, even more to a national governance and to some extent to a European uh, uh, parliament, who are the ones who take the, the, the final uh, decisions and uh, who are actually even reducing the ambition of the initial commission's proposal. I think it's important to make it clear, like yeah. we did yesterday in the Thank cap you, session. Harry. But uh, we have some questions from uh, from the audience, and there's especially one um, on methane that I want to address to, to Pierre-Marie. How can we better account for the shorter nature of methane so that it is not treated as cumulative in the same way as other greenhouse gas emissions? And then we have a, a related questions on how can we better recognize that agriculture is different from other sectors as it involves capture and release of carbon in the biological, cyclical approach. Pierre-Marie. Well, uh, conscious of time, I, I have two, three minutes to, to answer that question. Uh, excellent question, I would say, because uh, we, we all know that, uh, well, we, 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 we might be aware that methane is a short uh, leave uh, gas, uh, so it stays around 12 years in the atmosphere. Uh, it does not behave uh, as N2O or CO2 that are accumulated in the atmosphere. And that's important to have that in mind because the, the the, um, the potential radiative, uh, well, PRG, what meant, uh, ah, uh, well, the, the way in which the, 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 the respective impact of those gases is accounted for takes, in, well, uh, it translates those gases into a CO2 equivalent. I won't be long here. But the point is that uh, when we calculate CO2 equivalent emission, we do as if methane was accumulating in the atmosphere, which is not the case. The key point here is to distinguish between fossil methane, so the one we are going to take in the carbonifer strata uh, to like from Russia and elsewhere uh, to put in our uh, to put in our uh, heaters, and methane coming from biogenic sources and in particular uh, cows. And the key point around methane is that with that way of calculating uh, the climate impact of different gases, we always put the focus on remnants as the biggest problem we have uh, if we want to tackle climate change or climate mitigation in the actual sector. Yet, when we look at this uh, in a more nuanced way, taking into account the real behaviors of gases in the atmosphere, uh, the result is a bit different. And then what you have to consider is not methane and N2O separately, but you have to consider the mix of them in uh, the actual system you're looking at. So with that in mind, because basically, N2O will accumulate in the atmosphere and methane will not. Will not. And in that, in that perspective, what we did with colleagues from Oxford is that we modeled two scenarios, two contrasted scenarios. One based on a very strong land sparing approach where basically you uh, remove all ruminants uh, and you uh, keep a certain level of uh, grand river, so pork and poultry, relying, of course, on synthetic nitrogen, which emit N2O, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other hand, we uh, modeled a sort of land sharing scenario where we keep a certain level of ruminants, of course, less than today, but the bulk of the reduction in meat production comes from monogastric, so uh, pork and poultry. And the consequence of that is that on the short run, the land sparing scenario has a better impact on climate because it kills all the cows 
So it has a direct, uh, it has a cooling effect because you reduce the amount of methane emitted in the atmosphere. But on the long run, because it consumes more nitrous oxide, more N2O, which accumulates in the atmosphere, on the long run, the, the land sharing scenario, so with a little bit more remnants, but way less uh, nitrogen, has a better or at least equivalent climate impact than uh, the land sparing one. So this is really important to take into account because in the same time, those two scenarios has, have evidently very contrasted impacts on biodiversity, natural resources, and climate adaptation potential. So coming back to my initial uh, speech, which was about multifunctionality and multidimensionality of uh, looking at, at food systems, this is really important to have in mind, which does not mean that we do not need to reduce remnant herd in Europe, not at all, but just that we have to wait how we reduce that, uh, the herd of remnants against other benefits they render and against uh, the need for nitrogen when we keep the granivores uh, in, in the plate rather than remnants. So it was a bit long, sorry, and maybe a bit complex, uh, but the topic is quite complex. It is, and uh, I think it's very interesting that starting from a technical question on, on, the, on the, the duration of methane in the atmosphere, that you end up with these very uh, fundamental points. Uh, indeed, so I invite everybody to look again at what you, the work you've done on agroecology and a transition uh, by 2050 or so from a climate and biodiversity perspective. Uh, maybe I want to give a last word to, to Chef Ali as well before maybe I, I turn again to Christian for a final word um, about the regulation of externalities as well. I mean, one more element in this complex discussion, Shefali. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up, I think uh, a farmer from Portugal asked, you know, how can we as organic farmers be competitive uh, when the externalities are not actually integrated in uh, conventional agriculture? And I think that's a fundamental question. Uh, I mean, you can have the cap and you can have climate policy, but ultimately what we're gonna have to do fundamentally is regulate polluters, right? And that means part of it is to act, actually um, integrate the externalities. And, uh, and, and that's not to say that you pit producers versus consumers. I think that there's a fundamental question here about whether a large scale, agribusiness actually accounts for externalities in their cost of production, um, which then, you know, the cap is forced to bail out farmers because they're always paying below the cost of production. They're not actually accounting for the environmental costs or the public health costs for conventional agriculture. And I think we really need to think hard about how do we get um, agribusiness to actually pay the true cost of production. Um, and what are the policy frameworks and the regulations that we need to be able to do that so that organic farmers and progressive farmers are actually truly competitive um, and the cost, the environmental costs are integrated. I know that's a big political battle, but it's a huge part of the equation for where we need to get to in the, by the end of this decade. So I just want to bring that up. And the second Thanks. thing I want to, to offer really is that it would be we, I, we, ITP would be happy to facilitate an exchange with farmers in the U.S. You don't have to hear it from me, but I think that there's experiences that they can share about their experience with carbon markets and what's happening in the U.S. now. And I think there's a lot of learning to be done between European farmers and American farmers on this. So happy to arrange that if uh, you all would be interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chef Ali, and thanks again for joining us uh, at this uh, uh, hour in the morning uh, from the U.S. Uh, it's indeed important to, um, to, to, to learn from what has been done in terms of using carbon markets uh, as well. So thank you once again. Uh, we are almost run out, out of time, but uh, um, I want to give maybe a last word to, to Christian very quickly. You know, what are the next steps now on, on carbon farming on the Commission side, quickly? Yes. So the first big thing is, of course, our fit for 55 proposals that should give the overall orientation where we want to go from a climate, uh, uh, from the climate policy point of view. Um, and then uh, we, we are planning to have um, a communication towards the end of this year uh, where we want to bring together all these ideas that we've discussed now on carbon farming, but also on, on other other solutions for carbon removal, technical solutions. So we really want to give um, a few towards 2050 and really also to manage the expectations. As I said, carbon removals 
are not, in capital letters, are not the solution to, uh, to climate change, but they are an, an important part of it. And that we want to put into, into perspective. Um, I think also to frame the whole discussion that's now often going like into this and this, this, this direction, and, and you cannot imagine how many trees uh, people want to, to plant. Um, and on the other hand, so that would be the long-term view. On the other hand, as I think also said before, is we really also want to have an action plan. What can we do in the short term? We need to do a lot of research um, besides the common agricultural policy. We have the funds from Horizon. We have also our own life program that we are running together with DG Environment, where we look at these innovative uh, uh, initiatives that together uh, try to give incentives for biodiversity, for climate, so that we can get all this learning, learning experience here. And uh, so because I think we need to, to work at both levels. We need to understand much better what, what can be done. And we need to get uh, a view of where we want to, to go and what could be uh, the policy framework for the next decades. And there again, I would, I, what, what I would think is there will be a lot of diversity. There will be not a one size fits all uh, solution. I mean, or, I mean, we've also heard about grasslands. I've talked a lot about uh, the rewetting of peatlands. So I think these are actions that we can already, already do and, uh, and go ahead and learn a lot from, from them, how uh, we can set better incentives and do better regulation, which is our job in, in Brussels. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. It's uh, only the start of a discussion, indeed, and I want to thank you all, uh, you panelists, for your contribution. It's been a very rich debate, uh, and uh, I think some very important points were made that we need to be further uh, discussed uh, as well. But it's time for me to, um, to now uh, end the floor to my colleagues uh, as well. Uh, so thank you again. We will start again in 50 minutes with a session and panel discussions on sustainable food systems as well. And uh, I want to, to like to, to say that we have different activities ready for you during the break. If you want to meet uh, interesting people, you can try the networking function. And if you feel like stretching, you can also join a 10 minutes uh, stretching uh, session that you can find on the top left side of the platform. So thank you once again to uh, uh, the speakers and the audience for joining this important discussion and see you again at uh, 11.45. Thank you.
that as well. Uh, welcome to all. We are back from the break. I hope you could enjoy your coffee and perhaps even have a nice walk. I'd like to welcome all the participants as well as our speakers to the session about uh, towards more sustainable food systems. I am Sylvia Schmidt. I work on food policies at iFarm Organics Europe. Um, and so, as you can imagine, the farm to fork strategy has been pretty high up on my agenda lately. And I am absolutely delighted to be moderating this panel today about a very important and really timely topic, sustainable food systems. As we have also discussed during uh, previous sessions yesterday and today, we need to transform the agri-food systems if we want to address the climate and the biodiversity crisis that we are faced with today. And in order to also make our farming system more resilient, just and sustainable from the farm to the fork. So the European Green Deal was, was published uh, December 2019. As you probably all know, it's the flagship initiative of this commission that is meant to reach climate neutrality by 2050. And it has several accompanying strategy. And for this, the purpose of this session, the most uh, relevant strategies are the farm to fork strategy and the EU biodiversity strategy that were published in May 2020. When the farm to fork strategy was published, the organic movement really welcomed its holistic uh, way and comprehensive manner of um, attempting to uh, restore the the problems i mean to 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 move towards more sustainable food systems and to address the crisis that we have today and keeping in mind that organic farming is a successful economic model for farmers that also has proven benefits for the environment and for biodiversity we were really happy to see the 25 percent targets meaning to reach 25 percent of organic land by 2030 in the eu with this target and with other initiatives in the farm to fork strategy, organic farming is really at its rightful place. It is described as being part of the solution to the current challenges, and it is put at the heart of a transition of European agriculture towards more sustainable food systems. I would say that most today will agree that we do need to move towards more sustainable food systems. However, opinions on how to get there will vary quite a lot. And some of the ways to move towards more sustainable food systems will be explored during this session. So after these short introductory words, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's session. Um, starting the session, we will have a video by the member of the European Parliament, Claude Gruffa. He is member of the Green Party, and he was also the president of BioCup, one of the leading organic retailers in France. After the video of Claude Gruffa, I will give the floor to Nathalie Chaz. She is the Director for Food Sustainability and International Relations at DG Santé of the European Commission. Good morning, Nathalie. I hope you're doing well. You're calling us from Brussels? Yes, good morning all from Brussels, which is very sunny still today. Yes, it's really quite hot. I'm also in Brussels. Um, Okay, uh, thank you, Nathalie. We'll hear from you later on. And after Nathalie, we will hear from Faustine ba Defosse. She is the IEEP External Impact Director and the Head of Agriculture and Land Management Program, um, IEEP being the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Good morning, Faustine, to you. Uh, I hope you're well as well. Thank you for joining us. You're also calling us from Brussels? Indeed, yes, yes. <laughs> Great, Great to have you with us. Um, then we will move away from Brussels, very probably, with Dora Drexel. She is the Managing Director of the Hungarian Research Institute of Organic Agriculture. And importantly, she is also uh, one of the IFOM Organics Europe board members. Good morning, Dora, to you. Uh, you are calling us from Hungary, I presume? Yes, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank good you morning, for Dora. the invitation. Yes, I'm calling from Budapest. <laughs> very lovely city. And. Um, Last but certainly not least, we then have Tobias Bando. He is the managing partner at Soul and More Impacts, which can roughly be resumed, and Tobias, you will correct me if I'm wrong, as a sustainability consulting company. And he will surely explain the work they do much better than I can. Good morning, Tobias. Uh, how are you doing, and where are you calling us from? Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm calling in from uh, sunny Hamburg, Germany. Also a very nice city. Um, great, thank you for, for joining us. And before we start with the video of Mr. Griffa, I would just like to remind our audience that you can ask questions via the Slido function. So you're extremely welcome to ask questions. We'll be delighted to reply to them. 
but please ask them under, you go under Slido on the right side of your live stream and then under Q&A. Do not ask questions for participants in the chat as we might miss them. Okay, without further ado, I think I will give the floor to Claude Gruffa with his video. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je voudrais tout d'abord remercier l'IFOAM pour son invitation et vous dire le plaisir que j'éprouve à me retrouver parmi vous, même si c'est virtuellement. J'espère que ce congrès permettra d'ouvrir un champ nouveau au développement de l'agriculture biologique en Europe. Ce panel est donc intitulé « Vers un système alimentaire plus durable ». Au niveau institutionnel, ce thème est couvert par trois feuilles de route de la Commission européenne, sa stratégie de la ferme à la table, celle de, sur la biodiversité et son plan d'action pour l'agriculture biologique. Rappelons également que la Commission prépare un plan de protection des sols européens et qu'elle a récemment dévoilé sa stratégie « Zéro pollution pour une population et une planète en meilleure santé », évidemment important pour la question alimentaire et les pratiques agronomiques. En tant qu'élu du Parlement européen et membre de la Commission de l'agriculture, j'ai accueilli avec beaucoup d'attention et d'intérêt ces documents. Mon appréciation générale est que l'on y trouve beaucoup de belles intentions, mais peu de propositions opérationnelles, concrètes et encore moins de moyens financiers permettant de passer des mots aux actes. Mais la démarche globale reste à encourager. En effet, j'en partage le constat de base qui consiste à acter la fragilité et les insuffisances du modèle alimentaire européen actuel, trop fragile face aux enjeux du climat et de l'environnement. Un modèle qui n'est plus gage de santé et a échoué à assurer un revenu décent à nos paysans. La stratégie de la ferme à la table, qui s'inscrit dans le cadre du Pacte vert de l'Union européenne, propose une perspective intéressante. On n'y parle plus seulement de politique agricole commune, mais bien d'un système alimentaire durable et résilient. Je suis sensible à cet angle nouveau, fondé sur une approche holistique qui constitue un appel au changement à la fois dans les méthodes de production agricole, mais aussi dans les comportements alimentaires. La Commission reconnaît que nous pouvons faire beaucoup mieux que ce que nous faisons aujourd'hui. Militant historique de l'agriculture et de l'alimentation biologique, ce n'est pas moi qui vais les contredire sur ce point. Un système agricole et alimentaire durable doit être capable de fournir des denrées alimentaires saines à un prix abordable, tout en contribuant favorablement au climat, à l'environnement et à l'emploi paysan. La Commission européenne affiche beaucoup d'ambition, réduction de l'utilisation des pesticides et des antibiotiques, renforcement des systèmes alimentaires régionaux et locaux, amélioration du bien-être animal, etc. Elle propose surtout la promotion de l'agriculture biologique en faisant passer ses surfaces à 25% des terres agricoles en 2030, un objectif détaillé dans son plan d'action pour l'agriculture biologique. Lors de sa publication, j'ai accueilli plutôt favorablement ce plan d'action. J'ai également émis quelques commentaires, dont voici les principaux. Tout d'abord, je relève avec intérêt l'accent mis sur la stimulation de la demande. Prendre comme principal levier les attentes des consommateurs pour faire évoluer la production et les surfaces fait sens. Mais comme je l'ai dit à la Commission, cette demande existe déjà le plus souvent. L'enjeu pour moi consiste à plus à sécuriser la confiance des consommateurs dans les produits de l'agriculture biologique. Cela se passe par des contrôles rigoureux, rigoureux et par une meilleure information, notamment en termes d'étiquetage. Il faut également empêcher toute confusion possible entre les produits issus de l'agriculture biologique et ceux de l'agriculture conventionnelle, mais surtout du pseudo amélioré. Une stratégie de plus en plus agressive du monde de l'industrie et de la grande distribution à coups de labels mensongers et de greenwashing. Le deuxième, dans son plan d'action, la Commission entend également stimuler la production biologique, faciliter les conversions. Mais pour espérer atteindre 25% des surfaces en bio, il faudrait des moyens budgétaires bien plus importants. Aujourd'hui, pour les 8,5% des surfaces qu'elle valorise en Europe, l'agriculture biologique ne reçoit que 1,8% du budget de la PAC. La PAC, et ce n'est pas le moindre des, para des paradoxes, est l'ennemi de l'agriculture biologique. Pourtant, celle-ci est plébiscitée par les citoyens qui sont de plus en plus sensibles aux enjeux environnementaux, sociaux et de santé. Le projet de PAC en l'État ne s'attaque pas à cette distorsion, bien au contraire. Troisième point, aussi, je considère qu'il est indispensable de soutenir l'organisation des filières biologiques en associant entre eux 
et sur le long terme, producteur, collecteur, transformateur et distributeur au sein de, stru au, au sein de structures à taille humaine, fournissant des produits de qualité artisanale et pas ultra transformés. La PAC à venir ne favorise pas non plus cela. Quatrième point, enfin, dans le monde de post-Covid, il faudra œuvrer à relocaliser l'agriculture par le développement de systèmes alimentaires régionaux et locaux durables, sains et résilients, bâtis sur l'engagement de l'ensemble des acteurs du territoire en rapprochant producteurs et consommateurs. Là encore, rien dans la PAC ne favorise ce type de démarche de souveraineté alimentaire territoriale. En conclusion, je reste persuadé que l'agriculture biologique est l'agriculture de l'avenir. Les Européens prennent peu à peu conscience que le modèle actuel de l'agriculture productiviste mondialisée n'est plus tenable. Mais pour que les promesses contenues dans les stratégies proposées ne restent pas des mots, elles doivent aujourd'hui se transformer en actes. La légitimité de l'Europe et la parole politique sont en jeu. Votre rôle dans cette perspective est essentiel. Alors, bon travail et merci de votre attention. Well, uh, thank you very much to Mr. Grufa for being here with us, even if only via video. Um, I think that as organic movement, we can share some of the messages that he conveyed, um, especially regarding the very good proposal by the Commission with the Farm to Fork strategy. And, and it's, a, it's, a good for, it's a first step in the right direction. We just do not have all the means to see what it will be like in practice as of yet. Um, But who better to uh, give us uh, an overview of what the, the Commission is focusing on when it comes to moving towards more sustainable food systems than uh, Ms. Uh, Nathalie Chaz, uh, as I said, DG Santé of the European Commission. So, uh, Nathalie, uh, the floor is yours. What is the Commission focusing on when it comes to moving towards more sustainable food systems? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel session. It's been over a year now since the Farm to Fork strategy was adopted, indeed as part of the European Green Deal, to address the challenges of building a sustainable food system in a holistic and comprehensive manner, as you rightly said in your introductory comment. It is a long-term strategy on how to transform the way we produce, we distribute, and we consume food. And we need novelty that it takes really an integrated food system approach, not limited to agriculture only, as is done we see in other parts of the world. And for this transformation to be successful, we, we need the engagement of all actors, global, European, national, regional, and local. The strategy needs to become in practice a common project. So overall, while the objective of the strategy were welcomed by all stakeholders, they see different possibilities, different pathways to achieve this objective. And this is really where we need to focus our efforts now, um, taking into account all the different views. And this is why the Commission now is working intensively on the various initiatives which are announced in the Farm to Fork Strategy Action Plan. You have consultation with stakeholders have already started or will start soon on each of these initiatives. And obviously, the organic sector has an important role to play in this transition. And this is why I'm pleased to be here today, to have been invited, to give you a bit of information on some of the Farm to Fork initiatives. So, of course, first, there is the Organic Action Plan, which was adopted and that the Member of the Parliament referred to. Yes, because one of the EU-wide targets of the strategy is indeed to reach 25% of agricultural land and organic farming by 2030. And one could say that the target is quite ambitious, indeed, and to achieve it, The Commission presented on 24th of March an action plan for the development of organic production, and you are well aware of it. It put forward 23 actions structured around three axes, which I think respond to the comment from the MEP, boosting consumption first, increasing production, improving the sustainability of the sector. And among the measures foreseen, you have initiative like to promote organic products and the organic logo, campaigns to build confidence and consumer trust in the organic system, and green public procurement, including institutional procurement. 
But now I would like to go beyond this action plan, which is for the organic sector only, and tell you a little bit more about a big horizontal uh, legislative proposal we are preparing, which will be applicable to the whole food system, whole food chain. This is the legislative framework for sustainable food system. Uh, you may have seen it was in the conclusion of the fitness check of the general food law. The current food legislative framework is largely inadequate to address sustainability. So this is why the Farm to Fork strategy announced the adoption by the Commission of a framework, new framework legislation proposal by 2023. And the purpose will be to shift the paradigm of placing food products on the union market from mainly food safety consideration to a wider approach integrating sustainability aspects. So very importantly, it will define the notion of the objective of a sustainable food system. It will create an enabling environment to support the transformation of the union food system into a sustainable one. We are currently reflecting on the possible building blocks of this legislation and an inception impact assessment will be published soon to seek views from stakeholders. I would just add that the proposal could contain provision on minimum mandatory criteria for sustainable food procurement, because we see really public procurement as a powerful tool to improve the availability and affordability of sustainable food and to promote healthy and sustainable diets in institutional catering. So we will look into mandatory sustainability criteria, which should, in our view, cover the three dimensions of sustainability. So we will build upon the current voluntary green public procurement criteria and complement them with nutritional, health and social criteria. But again, these are all very preliminary ideas. Still, we will analyze different options in a consultation of stakeholders, and this will be analyzed in the upcoming impact assessment. But next to this broad horizontal legislation, we are also preparing much more sectoral ones, such as legislation focusing more on the production side, for instance, to support the evolution of the agriculture sector overall, which will need to make efforts, as any other sector of the economy, towards sustainability. And I would just take two examples. First, pesticide. Here again, the strategy sets aspirational targets consisting of reduction by 2030 by 50% of the overall use and risk of chemical pesticide. This will be combined with a reduction by 50% of the use of more hazardous pesticide. And you may have noticed that end of May, we commissioned, we published the first update uh, showing progress towards meeting this target. And the results show that the use of pesticide is indeed declining in member states. Compared to the baseline period of 2015-2017, the EU saw reduction in the use and risk of chemical pesticide of 8% in 2018 and a further reduction of 5% in 2019. And the reduction of the use of more hazardous pesticide is also encouraging with a decrease of 12% in 2019. So as you can see, the trend is promising and it will be further supported by a legislative proposal which we are preparing which is a revision of the Directive on Sustainable Use of Pesticide, which, you know, put the integrated pest management at the heart of agriculture. And we are working to provide farmers with alternatives to chemical pesticide through action in the context of plant production regulation. For instance, we are taking action to facilitate the placing of pesticide containing biological active substance. And we have also started the fundamental revision of data requirements and uniform principle for the evaluation of microorganisms to make them more fit for purpose for their specific properties, which are quite different from chemical substance. Just a few words on animal welfare, and because it's not just about the pesticide, you are fully aware of the growing attention given by civil society to the area of animal welfare. And the revision of the legislation is now planned by 2023 to align it with scientific evidence, the latest scientific evidence, to broaden its scope, to make it easier to enforce, and of course, ultimately, to ensure a higher level of animal welfare. 
but this is not all about production. Uh, we are moving on towards a bit closer to the consumer. We have another initiative on labeling, you know, but I would still like, before concluding, to mention the Code of Conduct for Responsible Business and Marketing Practices. This is one of the first deliverable of the Farm to Fork strategy. And through this Code of Conduct, the Commission seeks voluntary commitment from what we call the middle of the chain actor, with a food company, association, organization, can be producer, retailers, hospitality sector, to take concrete action, focusing in particular on reformulating food products in line with guidelines for healthy diet, reducing the environmental footprint and energy consumption by becoming more energy efficient, adopting marketing and advertising strategy, taking into account the need of the most vulnerable, and reducing packaging in line with the new circular economy action plan. It is now almost finalized. It was prepared following a, a broad, inclusive, and transparent process. Yesterday, we held the last stakeholder meeting, and I would like to thank the Federation for Organic Agriculture for very important input in the discussion leading to the finalization of the code. We believe it will have an important impact of sustainable food system because the changes need to happen all along the chain, from production to consumer. And we believe the middle of the chain has an important role to play here. So I would just conclude by stressing that this sustainable transition implies a lot of work. It will be difficult, but it also offers important economic opportunities for all actors of the food system. And we think the organic farming is well placed to show leadership in this transition to a sustainable food system in Europe and more globally. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Nathalie, for really giving us an overview of uh, the Commission's thinking in terms of more sustainable food systems, going from the organic action plan to animal welfare, pesticides, um, and so on. And I can really imagine it being a lot of work. We are, of course, here to uh, contribute in, in any way we can. And just perhaps uh, one word on the organic action plan. Um, we were pleased with, with the result. We thank the commission for, for the work it has done on this organic action plan. Uh, now, again, it will be about how it uh, can be um, translated into practice and about involving all the important relevant actors. And these can be from the uh, local level to, to the national level and of course also the EU level. Um, but I'm sure uh, our board member, Dora Drexel, will say more about this uh, afterwards. Um, now I would like to give the floor. No, now I would like to, <laughs> apologies, uh, ask Natalie a follow-up question. So we are all extremely interested in this legislative framework for sustainable food systems. Um, it will be the first of its kind, um, and it's definitely... Uh, a legislative, a legislative framework that can help in the shift towards more sustainable food systems. So I'd like to ask you if you can, if you could tell us, um, you know, a bit more what it will cover in addition to uh, sustainable public procurement, uh, which parenthesis, we are grateful for the fact that in the organic action plan, uh, the commission has stipulated that it will include minimum mandatory criteria for organic in public procurement in the sustainable uh, food systems legislative uh, framework. So could you tell us a bit more about the content if possible and also the, the process of actually getting this, this framework? I mean, as you said, it is a lot of work and, and we're interested to know how, how you're, you're doing it basically. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can only give you preliminary ideas because we are still at the beginning of the process. Um, this is a legislative framework which set out really the general principle for an integrated approach to sustainability of food system. We believe that first the food chain has some specificity that deserve to be addressed in a specific way and to have this specific framework will allow to address the issue of sustainability through the whole food chain because many of the aspects, for instance, healthy and sustainable diet or reduction of food waste and loss or ensuring resilient food system, they cannot be settled at production level only. The, the solution comes from integrated approach all along the chain. And of course, the feature of sustainability of food system are not the same as the ones on food safety. Um, so we will probably take inspiration of the general food law regulation 
uh, to the extent that it contains definition, principle, and clarified responsibility of operators and competent authorities. But we need to create really a lex generalis, which establishes the basis for a coherent and consistent approach on sustainability, which probably then will be need to be found again in all sectoral legislation in food area. So it will have a spillover effect, let's say. That's how we would see it. Um, we need to cover all foods placed on the EU market, operation carried out in this context. And for instance, we could envisage minimum requirement for all food and more specific one for regulated products. Uh, but these are all, let's say, preliminary idea. And one possibility also is that we could have a sustainable food labeling framework, framework as part of its overall framework, which would cover in synergy with other relevant labeling initiatives, the provision of consumer information relating to nutritional, climate, environmental, and social aspects of food products. But we will follow all the better regulation principle in the adoption of this proposal, because you ask about the process. There will be stakeholder consultation. It will be very important in the preparation of this process. We'll start already this year with various means. For instance, we will soon publish uh, an inception impact assessment, which will then launch consultation. And it will be, I think, uh, uh, process uh, which will be inclusive and interactive with all stakeholders before we prepare this uh, present this proposal we have two years it seems short but it's, it's short and long at the same time for such a broad uh, framework and i would really uh, welcome um, the organic sector involvement in the preparation of this framework Yes, uh, thank you, Natalie. Indeed, two years seems quite a lot, but at the same time for a legislative framework, it, it will be tomorrow. So uh, good luck with the work and we will definitely be contributing to the public consultation and in any other way uh, we can. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Faustine Badefossé from the IEEP. So Faustine, what would you say uh, from your role in IEP is needed to move towards more sustainable food systems? Thank you, Sylvia. Well, first of all, uh, let me thank you for the invitation. It's a pity we're not uh, in, in Portugal, actually, as uh, it should have been without the pandemic. It's such a nice, uh, nice country that uh, I like very much. But uh, it is as it is. Um, yes, so before uh, moving on, uh, so next slide, please, uh, to some suggestions we have uh, uh, to make what the Commission has proposed within uh, uh, its farm to fork strategy and the other, uh, I mean, all the objectives falling underneath. Um, I wanted to, to come back to some background reflections first. I know, Sylvia, you said that, uh, um, well, Obviously, science is uh, unequivocal on the, uh, the needs to, uh, to change uh, uh, our current uh, uh, food systems. There is indeed a consensus. But I just wanted to uh, flag two things here before we move to the how. Um, there are two striking facts. One of them is uh, what we have come up with uh, in our Think 2030 uh, platform of experts back in 2018. And indeed, uh, in order to reach uh, uh, sustainable levels, and in particular to stay within planetary boundaries, on average, Europeans will have to reduce by 80% the amount of natural resources they currently use for nutrition, housing, mobility, and leisure by 2050. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude of the challenge that we have in front of us. For food and nutrition only, it means cutting it by half between now and then. The State of the Environment report that was published by the European Environmental Agency back in 2020 uh, did stress that we actually have the next decade left to scale up action. So not only the magnitude of the challenges is high, but the, narrow, uh, the window of opportunity is also narrow. And as Mr. Grufat said in his intervention, the COVID-19 pandemic has just stressed that needs even further. And indeed, the experts highlight that in order to reduce the risk of pandemics in the future, we need to tackle biodiversity decrease, and in particular, uh, uh, the, the, the decrease of biodiversity linked with intensive livestock production, habitat destruction, and zoonosis. So I think that this is very important to, to bear in mind. And actually, sustainable food system is really at the core of the solution to avoid future pandemics and mitigate in, in its impacts, because as we know, food and health are also intrinsically related. 
So yes, the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy have the potential to address that, to set us on the right path. It's actually the most ambitious narrative uh, from the Commission uh, uh, that has never been proposed, uh, but a series of actions are needed to make it work. And that's what I want to focus on in the rest of my intervention. So next slide, please. So first, the most important is to have coherent strategic planning and integrated approach for both production and consumption. The current discrepancies that we have in the laws affecting food production and consumption, directly or indirectly, be it the cap, environment legislation, climate trade, safety, competition law, etc., you name it, needs to be tackled. That is <clears throat> the priority. What we made as a, a recommendation back in 2018 was to have a sort of high level food and agriculture sustainability advisory board that could assess any upcoming law that would affect directly or indirectly our food system uh, and any new amendments uh, uh, to, to, the, to, to the existing ones. And they would assess the coherence also vis-a-vis -vis the overarching objectives uh, 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 that fall underneath the Green Deal and uh, international agreements that the EU is bound uh, by. There is no, again, there is no sustainable production without sustainable consumption. That is a fact that's two sides of the same, of the same coin. Yet, yet, unfortunately, the farm to fork strategy as it is uh, uh, proposed still focuses very much on production more than on consumption. It has binding targets, and Natalie has said, said that, on pesticides reduction, on organic, on fertilizers, etc. But when it comes to consumption, it of course has several initiatives, but they are mostly relying on voluntary measures and they are not uh, 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 quantified. It seems to be missing the concept of food environment, as indeed consumers' choices are actually not driven by price, prices and labels only. It is way more complex than that. There are physical, social, economic, cultural, political factors that influence our choices. So, Again, the food and legislative framework that is going to be proposed in 2023 uh, can certainly help uh, uh, for having that more integrated approach and reconciliate production and consumption. And what we suggest to do so is to have um, a food uh, uh, um, sustainability programs, plans, working alongside with the CAP uh, 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 strategic plans. So you would have on the one side plans focusing on consumption and on the other side uh, uh, plans focusing on, 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 on production. Together falling underneath the same overarching objectives, the Green Deal objectives. They will be made of basic rules, so for the consumption plans, uh, you know, all the binding legislation, let's say, that would mirror the conditionality that you have uh, for the CAP strategic plans, and you would also have a series of policy incentives. And what's interesting here is that we would ask, the Commission would ask the Member States to use all these different schemes coherently you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Green Deal, uh, the Green Deal objectives, and that high-level advisory board that I mentioned would also be there to actually assess the coherence of the plans. And what's very important also to stress is the participatory approach, because this is not going to work if we do not involve all the different stakeholders at different level, local, regional, national, EU, uh, in the process from the beginning until the end. And I. I I believe that the Commission has very well understood that because uh, in, in how uh, Natalie described the process for the farm to fork, uh, uh, from the, sorry, for the full legislative framework. Next slide, please. Um, but these are the building blocks, what I have presented. Now, further actions are actually needed. Uh, there are actions beyond the cap and actions related to the cap because the cap is still uh, the elephant in the room, let's say, with a, a large uh, budget influencing uh, the way our land is being managed and, and, and the food that we eat. So first is to have a safe operating space for livestock production and consumption, because out of the agriculture uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of the emissions come from livestock, as we know, and almost 70% of the land is used for livestock production directly or indirectly. It's interesting to see that the strategy, the farm to fork strategy, refers to promotion programs to support the most sustainable carbon efficient methods of livestock production. Uh, especially it's interesting uh, because today uh, a third of the promotion budget is spent on meat and dairy, while not even 20% is uh, spent on fruits and vegetables, so this would have to be uh, revised. 
The strategy says that um, there is a need to increase the availability and source of alternative proteins, so that's the protein transition. Unfortunately, what we see happening with the CAP uh, uh, discussions right now, especially on the crop rotation, <laughs> where there would, there would have been an opportunity to, uh, um, um, let's say, incentivize, you know, crop rotation and the use of leguminous, et cetera, and increase the alternative and help with the protein transition. This doesn't seem to go in the right direction under the CAP uh, uh, discussion. Another point are the fiscal measures allied with greater education. Uh, and Mr. Gruff has said it, we really need to rebalance the cost of food where sustainable products become cheaper and more convenient to consumers, while the unsustainable ones become more expensive. Fiscal instruments are key, uh, they are key lever. Uh, they can include taxation on specific inputs in such a way to internalize uh, the cost of this in terms of emissions, health, or their environmental impact. For instance, taxation on nutrients or pesticides that would increase the cost of these inputs, but at the same time, that would also gather revenue that can then be found for awareness raising and implementation of sustainable alternatives. So that's a virtual uh, uh, mechanism, let's say. Uh, uh, um, next, next slide, please. Um, now, moving from uh, the, the actions beyond the CAP to the CAP-related actions, because as I said, I mean, uh, the CAP is still quite a substantial tool that is keeping all of us very busy right now. Because, I mean, as we know, next week there should be actually a deal found on, 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 on the future of this policy. But one thing that we should always remind ourselves with is that the CAP is not an end in itself. It is actually a tool as a public policy that is there to support uh, 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 you know, whatever objectives that the, that the uh, European, the EU has set for itself. So it is very important that first and foremost, there is a strong alignment between the CAP strategic plans and the Green Deal objectives. It is our understanding that this is heavily being debated now. Uh, the Parliament is uh, uh, pushing for that. Uh, and it seems that the Council is not necessarily on the same uh, page. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the deal uh, will go in the right direction on that. There is also a need for strong accountability and monitoring of the national cap strategic plans, and the same goes with the food strategic plans, which I have mentioned at the beginning. That is essential. We need to see whether it's working, whether it needs to be refined as we go, uh, and it also needs to be participatory. That's very important. That uh, uh, you know, in order to have a certain buy-in, also from from, from not, not not just from from the farmers, but from the whole uh, uh, stakeholders and citizens, it needs to be participatory. The, we, we need to move towards a cap resource oriented payments. The cap should be financing the, uh, uh, the transition. Uh, in what has been proposed seems to be going in the right direction because we're moving from compliance to uh, uh, results, but it all depends on what is going to be adopted uh, uh, next week and eventually how this is going to be translated into practice. The eco scheme has the potential to do so, but it really depends on what member states will make, will make out of this scheme eventually. And last but not least, uh, uh, it is important to remove all the environmental harmful subsidies under the future cap. On that, what's happening with the voluntary coupled supports, for instance, uh, uh, on livestock and the fact that all the safeguards that had been proposed by the parliament do not seem to be on the table anymore is quite uh, worrying. Next and last slide, in a nutshell, so the, the new legal framework for sustainable food system, which is going to be uh, proposed in 2023, uh, has the potential to, 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 to address both production and consumption together. Um, and uh, we, we suggest that it is done through the strategic planning for, you know, through the food consumption plans and uh, the uh, CAP strategic plans. Uh, but it also relies on other actions which I have, uh, I have listed. The CAP post-2020 reform offers opportunity, but that alignment between the Green Deal objective and the farm to fork and the CAP strategic plans uh, is key and essential. And of course, then the monitoring of that is not just a ticking the box exercise and say, yes, it is a fit for purpose, it's then to actually be able to demonstrate uh, it is. And uh, um, agriculture policy influences how farmland is managed, uh, but other policy areas are key for shaping food systems, fiscal instruments, as I mentioned, uh, and a few others. 
Importantly, don't forget that strategic research and knowledge access are also key essential enablers of the transition. This is an important instrument alongside with advices and trainings that then tends to be undermined, but this is essential as well, uh, uh, that, that element within the cap or outside. And last but not least, uh, as I said, uh, the Farm to Fork strategy and the Green Deal are the most ambitious narrative of the EU to date. But let's not forget that at this stage, it is no more than a political project and there is no standing beyond the legislation that will be approved underneath. And so it relies on European processes and most and foremost, actually, on the willingness of the member states to implement these changes because they're always quite key. And as we can see what's happening in the CAP debate and that tendency to push for the status quo, there will need to be, I mean, there will be a strong need for a change in mindset at national level. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank you very much, Christine, for your uh, messages and also your concrete ideas of, of how to uh, shape the sustainable food systems legislative proposal. That was uh, quite interesting to hear. Um, I'd like to ask you one question. So the IEP recently published the EU Green Deal Barometer. Um, and I think our audience could find it interesting to know what it is. Could you let us know what it is and what its main results were quite briefly, please? Thank you. Yes, indeed. So that's the first initiative of, 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 of its kind. Uh, we published it, uh, we, we launched uh, the first uh, 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 part of it uh, last April. Uh, it is a, a barometer made of uh, um, a survey, basically, of uh, 300 uh, sustainability experts from governments, uh, regulators, NGOs, academia, etc. And the idea is that we publish it annually. So on, and, and that will help uh, monitor the progress uh, of the Green Deal implementation from their views. And this will be accompanied with also a set of indicators and a dashboard that we are working on for the time being. So maybe to stress, and that relates very much to what I've said about, you know, that needs to change, you know, for a change in mindset at national level, the key findings from that Eurobarometer, uh, so, it's not a Eurobarometer, sorry, Green Deal barometer, uh, my apologizes, um, is that over a third of the respondents see the lack of commitment by the member states as the biggest barrier to the Green Deal implementation. So I think that this is quite a, a striking uh, uh, outcome. And uh, uh, only 14%, so less than 15, uh, uh, see that adequate progress have been made on preserving, restoring uh, biodiversity and on sustainable and healthy agriculture. So there is still an effort to be made there from the uh, respondents to the survey. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, thank you for giving us this overview. Um, it's quite an ex interesting exercise that you did there. And um, without uh, further ado, I think I will just give the floor to Dora Drexler. Um, Dora, as IFOM Organics Europe board members, member, what are your views in terms of moving towards more sustainable food systems? Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. It's a very interesting uh, intervention already. Uh, just uh, that everybody knows a bit uh, my background. I'm, I'm coming from the research. I'm directing the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture in Hungary. So I'm also coming from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and I, as, as Sylvia mentioned, I am proud to be board member and one of the vice presidents of IFAM Organic uh, Europe. So that's uh, the, the background from where I'm, I'm going to speak uh, today about the organic action plan mainly. So a lot of things have already been stated and uh, I have to support and uh, want to uh, make a point that it's really a milestone document, the organic action plan. If we uh, compare what was uh, included in the action plan uh, for the la last, uh, so the seven years before, it was considered as a niche market, as a small issue, uh, not at all at the heart of uh, policies. This has changed and this is something really great. The organic sector is, is pleased uh, about this and we are fully committed and also devoted to support the realization, I must say. So coming then uh, further, the amb ambition uh, of the farm to fork strategy and, and uh, actually the 25% uh, organic area, on the other hand, as mentioned already, might uh, uh, 
might uh, be uh, taken with some reservations or even uh, criticism by member states. So it is a, a, a very important issue that was mentioned by Fossin as well to involve and engage them. I will come back to this point a bit uh, later. What is needed is uh, also what say, stated already is system thinking and uh, it is great that the Commission ring fenced 30% of the Horizon Europe budget for topics relevant for organic. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm also working as a researcher, so we know and it's great that the Commission acknowledged that it's not enough to pay uh, territorial payments, aerial payments, uh, or even uh, consumer side uh, incentives, it's important to foster the research and the development of new tools, sustainable tools for organic and also for uh, not yet certified, especially for not yet certified farms who want to, to make a conversion and uh, become part of realizing the 25% organic uh, area. Uh, aim. It's also important again to stress that this is an average aim of the EU. So it's uh, something which comes up often that uh, how could a member state provide 25% if it, it's only 2% uh, right now, the proportion of organic land. So I'm just uh, mentioning this, that this is an EU average, uh, but still it's very ambitious. So as far as I know, the calculations without any extra effort would be to reach about 18 percent so it's uh, 25 is still quite high we have to do a lot to reach this uh, the incentive which was also mentioned the green public procurement and uh, the minimum criteria it's really relevant it's very relevant that it's not only voluntary because uh, that would not create enough uh, momentum the market can be broadened uh, a uh, fortunate uh, issue is that the market uh, already is quite uh, well responding to organic and demanding organic products, but it's uh, really great to have this um, piloting by public uh, procurement uh, in member states. Uh, the sea region where I come from uh, also appreciates uh, and would uh, would uh, would recommend to uh, put more emphasis on, on value chain development and also uh, the affordability of organic products. Uh, this is something which is mentioned in terms of the true cost accounting and, uh, and uh, some research which will be done on uh, taxation issues. Uh, this uh, part is essential because uh, as you know, as Central East and European member states are a bit lagging behind in policy regarding organic and also the percentage of area is uh, smaller. However, this doesn't mean that the uh, absolute number of area is small. It is, in fact, very large. 2% of Romanian agricultural land is huge. Uh, and it uh, means that there are a lot of, uh, lot of products coming from there and from other Central Eastern European countries, mainly uh, to the markets of uh, Western and Central European countries. And there is a bit of reservation what will happen if uh, these very productive agricultural areas become uh, uh, yielding less or become in a price not so competitive with uh, third country imports. And I know that this might seem as a hard criticism or even uh, uh, some uh, arguments to uh, from member states to block uh, things, but uh, I think it's important to, to, to take this and tackle this and uh, answer this question in order to bring these member states who, uh, who talk about this criticism to the table and, um, and uh, take this consideration seriously and uh, reply to them in order to engage them. Because that's uh, actually what we see. Uh, what was also mentioned, that member state engagement is, is the key. And uh, I'm working also in the BioEast initiative, which is uh, encompassing 11 member states from the Central Eastern uh, European region on ministerial level. Together with research institutes, we developed a platform uh, for the organic action plan development. Yesterday was the day when we had the first uh, conference on this uh, and uh, Mr. Diego Cangafano, the principal advisor on organic uh, action plans also participated. We aim with this also to uh, create the platform to engage member states 
on a voluntary basis to share uh, our thoughts and our practices within the member state uh, planning uh, ministries, but it, it needs more. I think it's really nice that uh, the questionnaire uh, was uh, now sent out to member states on how they are planning to write their organic action plans on a national level. As far as I know, uh, they, they have, the member states have one month to fill out such a questionnaire and this means that they are obliged to think about it, they are obliged to engage the local stakeholders or at least uh, they get a kind of push from the Commission, which I think is uh, quite necessary to make a point that this uh, has to be uh, taken seriously. The other uh, main point is uh, the harmonization with the CAP. This was also mentioned, I'm uh, wrapping up very shortly, that uh, the aim, the in uh, intention of the organic action plan is really positive, the sector is behind it, but uh, the CAP will be the main uh, issue funding mechanism which has to be aligned in the strategic plans and this is uh, also something which member states have to do. We have to make them aware how to do it, we have to help them how to do it and engage them in this. Also, I find that the initiative of the Commission to invite organic uh, actors or uh, actually representatives of ministries as ambassadors for the organic action plan to one table, which is also going on right now, a quite a constructive uh, solution for uh, engaging ministries uh, more and more, but uh, uh, there are still uh, a lot of things to do to, to make the machines working at local level ministries. So wrapping up, uh, I just want to stress uh, that organic can deliver, the can live up to the expectations of uh, the Green Deal of the organic action plan. It performs well, it can uh, deliver uh, affordable food and a fair way to farmers uh, while uh, safeguarding our environment, but we have to do a lot to make this operational and uh, uh, the success uh, will be uh, afterwards the result of such a strategic thinking. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dora, for your intervention and also for bringing in the Central uh, Eastern uh, European perspective, which is which is always really interesting. Um, I know <laughs> that you're um, working on a um, you're coordinating a pilot network of living labs. Could you briefly tell us what they are and why they're important in this whole context of sustainable food systems? Yes, thank you. That's true. The Living Lab is an approach also which uh, is uh, uh, fully supported by the Commission. Also, we are taking part in the preparations of the Agroecology Partnership where we are working on a nucleus of the future network of living labs who uh, are actually very participatory groups working in real life environments together with farmers and other actors of the value chain to support them in transitioning to agroecological, uh, including organic, of course, uh, methods and the adoption of such innovations in practice is much higher if we do the whole process together in a real life environment. So living labs are uh, a way which we work since 2012 in Hungary. We got them acknowledged as living labs by the European network of living labs last year. And we are really proud to coordinate this uh, network, which hopefully will be a tool to operationalize as well uh, the research results into practice uh, in this direction. Thank you. Great, thank you for this insight. It's it's really interesting. And now, uh, as I said, last but not least, we have Tobias Spandel from Soil and More Impacts. Uh, and I decided to keep this intervention for last because it differs a tiny bit from the previous interventions. The previous interventions focus more on policy, on insights about research. Tobias will tell us more about his domain of expertise, such as true cost accounting, and really more of what companies can already do now to contribute to moving towards more sustainable food systems. So Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much also for inviting me and thank you for all the previous speakers and their very important work on uh, policy and research. So we, we certainly need 
exactly that and more of it. Um, we need ad adjusted regulations, which incentivizes truly sustainable companies and which also punishes companies and supply chains that focus only on short-term benefits at cost of uh, the environment and society today and in the future. So we as Soil and More as just said, uh, we approach this challenge from a uh, different level. Um, we mostly work with private sector companies, both organic and conventional. I myself, I started my professional life on an organic farm, biodynamic farm, even in Egypt, Sekem. Some of you may know it, so my, my heart beats for farmers, but now we mostly work and for organic farmers, but now we mostly work for our companies, um, both organic and conventional. So this is the perspective I'm going to talk um, from in the next couple of minutes. So what, what are we doing? What is our experience? Um, what we are trying to do in terms of, yeah, moving faster towards sustainable food systems. We help our clients on the one hand with the implementation of better farming practices, hands on concrete at field level with compost workshops, etc. But we also assist them in determining what sustainability actually means to them. Um, and applying amongst others a true cost accounting approach. We look especially also on the economic impact of sustainability. Um, and uh, in particular, we also look at the economic risks if they don't apply sustainable practices. So we want to show actually to the world and to the companies that sustainability is not just a cost for compliance or you know a budget item in your marketing budget, but it's actually an investment into business continuity. And you know, on this journey with our clients, um, one little uh, trick helps us um, if we uh, take the heavily abused and also if we, as we heard earlier, sometimes greenwashed word, um, sustainability, if you rephrase this, just uh, reorder the letters in a different way, then you can call it ability to sustain. And that is sort of more clear what it's actually about. So sustainability isn't just about marketing. It's not just a marketing term. It's about identifying and implementing practices that actually sustain the business under changing circumstances. So following this approach, uh, our clients still hope and wait, obviously, uh, for adjusted policies, uh, example, new tax, VAT regulations, new, uh, new laws, etc. But at the same time, they also realize we can't wait. I, we, we hope it, it's, it's happening for governmental regulatory level, but we also, from a pure business interest, we need to move ahead. It's our own pure business profit-driven interest to actually start applying sustainable practices to make sure the company actually survive as a company, but also in the supply on a supply chain level. Concrete, uh, if they if they sequester carbon and with it build up humus, they better survive the next dry summer. This might be more expensive, obviously, at first sight, but if they don't do it, it's uh, it's going to cost them more. So they start to realize this rather a, a higher procurement price, um, but say, no, it's actually um, a preventive maintenance measure in order to be able to deliver goods in the future. I want to, uh, to include a, a short quote um, from Allianz Insurance, um, which they published back already in September 2018, where they said, the local flora and fauna suffers as a result of excessive fertilization and pesticides used at the supplier's plantation. At the same time, the area becomes less fertile and more vulnerable to external environmental impacts. So this is not an organic journal, it's Allianz Insurance Corporation. The supply from the plantation becomes more expensive and volatile, creating regular interruptions in the supply chain. An enterprise risk management addressing the supplier's plantation management practices from an environmental sustainability perspective is necessary. End of quote. So this Allianz report is titled a business sector analysis of natural capital risk. And Allianz actually asks addressing traders, processors, brands to include what they call natural capital risks, meaning soil, water, climate, biodiversity in the company's risk assessments. And with it asks the companies to mitigate these risks in order to qualify for an insurance policy such as uh, business interruption. So in a way, Allianz asks for an ecologization of organic uh, of agriculture and asks for a translation of sustainability performance in the supply chain into economic terms at corporate level 
there certainly are various approaches to do this, but we found out that true cost accounting is a very useful tool to bring transparency to the true economic performance of a company, preparing for the company and farmers for new requirements from the financial market. Interestingly, not to comply with new laws, but to better manage the assets, put it in financial terms. So following this logic, applying compost or using cover crops is a maintenance measure on our asset soil. It's not a nice sustainability project. It is actually core business. This new reporting, be true cost accounting or something else, is complex, yes, and requires lots of data. But actually what we found out is that when analyzing our clients' existing supplier assessments, be it CO2 assessments or social compliance audits, there is already lots, if not most, of the data available required to actually assess a company's true economic performance, including supply chain risks. We assessed already several hundred supply chains looking at true cost benefits and risks. This is also a very yeah, interesting new um, viewpoint to look at the supply of the performance uh, on the performance of supply chains, not so much compliance oriented, but from a pure impact orientation. And um, yeah, independent actually how, how that uh, farm or supply chain is called or labeled, um, it really looks just on the impact. So lots of hidden costs surface during these uh, exercises, also in organic supply chains. But most interestingly, these analyzes also showed that what I want to call net positive agriculture is possible, even with animals. So in agriculture, which isn't just less bad, but it actually adds more value to society and environment than it causes harm. So this is possible and it can be shown with mainstream tools which are, which are out there available. So the good is that uh, sustainability or true cost impacts of these practices can be assessed within existing mainstream tools, such as a cool farm tool, some of you may know, or other tools. The real challenge actually is not the data or the scientific models from our experience, but the translation of agricultural or sustainability terms such as earthworms per square meter into financial market terms because bankers don't understand that yet. But actually, through our journey with EY, for instance, KPMG and others, we learned that actually there are pragmatic ways to do so, to translate earthworms per square meter into financial market terms, um, because the financial market realized that in order to get a real credit worthiness check of a farm or supply chains, they need to consider earthworms, otherwise they're missing out something. There obviously, and I want to, uh, to end with this, there obviously still is quite some homework ahead of us, and I invite everybody to join this journey. But yeah, let's use the data we have, let's lose the experience we have, and let's capitalize on this opportunity to use the financial market as an accelerator for the transformation towards more sustainable food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this slightly different perspective, which is uh, very interesting uh, to hear as well. Um, I was particularly um, even maybe surprised to hear that sustainability becomes ability to sustain, which makes absolute sense and it's a nice way of seeing it. And also that net positive agriculture is uh, possible. That's definitely um, you know something that um, I'll be happy to, <laughs> to go home with today. Um, I wanted to ask you, bringing perhaps back the debate a uh, tiny bit more towards the, the policy side. So from the results um, that, from, from the studies that you do and the work that you do, what would you say are policy related uh, low hanging fruits when it comes to uh, true cost accounting? So, I mean, I would immediately jump in and say, you know, um, do a tax reform and, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, punish the bad guys and, uh, and incentivize the good guys. But I, I heard that, you know, doing a tax reform is slightly complicated, um, so still we need it. Um, but I think a very maybe easy first step is to ask for disclosures, to ask, like we have this already on the, on the carbon side, that large-scale listed companies have to disclose their carbon footprint, but ask companies who operate at least in food and farming to disclose their externalities to bring transparency um, to uh, uh, to the consumer but also b2b to to, uh, to investors to banks um, to show that they might offer products very cheaply but that there is hidden cost and others who may offer 
products more expensive that they actually already have a lot of job done on the ecosystem service level. So I, I think that could be a low hanging fruit to sort of push for transparency and ask them for, uh, um, for disclosures of those externalities. Okay, thank you very much. And um, now we move towards uh, a Q&A session. So all of our speakers should be on the screen. And um, I'll start with a question that has been asked for uh, Nathalie. Um, how can the Commission ensure that the new sustainable food labeling uh, framework does not undermine organic and contributes to a real transformation of our food system? And when you reply to that, you can also um, get back to any of the other speakers potentially that, that have you know, mentioned policies or so feel free to, to reply to that. Okay, yes, I was unmuting myself, sorry. Um, okay, the first thing is that it is really a new area of work for us. There is a limited experience within the EU on that sort of sustainability level that will be comprehensive. So we are really starting, uh, I think, with an open mind. We definitely, the purpose is, of course, not to undermine the organic logo. So that is why I'm saying we are taking, a uh, we'll be looking at what exists today, we'll be reflecting on what is possible, and we will be engaging with stakeholders on what will be the best uh, outcome. Uh, we still believe there is a demand, and in, there was a few comments by other speakers that this is not only about production, this is about changing in consumption. We fully agree. We certainly agree that for many different reasons, including for health reasons. Uh, we need a shift in consumption in uh, Europe, um, especially for more towards a healthier diet, uh, so for environmental reasons, but also for health-related reasons. And we see the labels are one of the tools. I want to say yes, one of the tools, because we were mentioned about promotion program. Indeed, we are revising a, prom a promotion program in the EU so that it is a little more in line with the farm to fork strategy. There are a number of comments made on fiscal aspect. Uh, I would agree there is a lot of potential in taxation, but from the EU side, we know how complicated it is. So I would not certainly not take it as a low-hanging fruit from our perspective, uh, even though we, we, we need to foster the consumption, let's say, of more sustainable products. There are different ways, I like say, you have the promotion program, we have the public procurement, which we see as an important tool. We will use also the different labeling option, but this, uh, for the sustainable labeling, we will take our time to do it well, because we have very limited experience. And we, this is also why, because there were comments also about creating uh, an enabling environment, which we definitely agree we need also to change the food environment. And this is also where the experience we are developing at the moment with the code of conduct, where we are asking company to submit commitments and to report to us how they implement the commitments report in a transparent manner, not just yes. to us, to everyone. Uh, we are different tool that we hope will help uh, support this change of consumption. Uh, for the sustainable food labeling, we don't have the, all the answers now, so we are very happy to engage in a dialogue with the uh, organic sector as well on how best to develop it. Um, Natalie, I think you muted yourself automatically. Uh, yeah, yeah, because I think I finished my uh, reply, I hope. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, there is another question from the audience for Natalie, but first I would like to see whether the other speakers want to come in to uh, reply potentially to points made by your fellow speakers uh, at this point. Okay, uh, then um, I will ask the other question from the audience to uh, Nathalie. Uh, how can the Commission ensure that there is sufficient consumer demand for organic products in line with the growth of the percentage of organic land? Indeed, the uh, importance of moving demand and supply more or less at, at the same level is, is very important. Otherwise, it will create um, market distortions. Um, Nathalie, can you, would you like to reply to that?
again trying to unmute myself yes we we certainly agree that uh, both production and consumption need to uh, grow in parallel uh, we think there is uh, the organic farming respond to a growing demand today already and i think uh, figures were indicated huh? i know that you said 18 percent is uh, feasible so we need certainly to boost the development of organic farming in your eu but as well the consumption in order to be able to reach the target we have indicated uh, there are a number of tools we need to be to see first the cap how it continue we we'll continue to support organic production definitely you have the new organic action plan which was adopted in march as i say which we think will accompany development of agriculture and aquaculture sector as well which is quite uh, important in the field of uh, organic to it will it's a important action plan to stimulate production as i say processing but also consumer demand um, there will be a uh, measure to, to promote organic product. We believe the public procurement, green public, public procurement will help. And I would like to add, because I think there were reference to that as well, that indeed the European Commission is supporting research and innovation activity to accelerate the transition, eh, including organic, for organic farming. We have uh, important project important budget i think i've noted uh, 236 million euro were allocated to support more than 40 projects relevant to agro ecology on the horizon 2020 and with the new program i think the, the trend will uh, even increase so we are trying to have some sort of a toolbox let's say with a number of uh, tools to support both production and consumption and what is i think with this we have a little bit to see how the action plan will develop will be implemented and the success it will bring but we are confident that we have today put in place instrument to really foster as we say uh, production process and consumption okay thank you natalie for your uh, reply um so it seems like you're you're very popular today so there are quite a lot of questions for <laughs> for natalie but i think this uh question can also be uh asked to uh tobias that um is it possible that the commission's work for an enabling environment can also enable allow lower vat on organic food perhaps from your perspectives of, as of course you're not representing the the commission Exactly. So, um, so I leave it to the professionals how to uh, how to revise uh, text, etc. But I mean, just to give an example, when we do our true cost calculations, we see that some farmers or let's say supply chains already uh, spend money, um, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, to generate some ecosystem services, taking care of carbon sequestration, saving the water, generating biodiversity. So that sort of this ecosystem service or service to society is already part of the cost calculation while others um, actually don't do much about this and the repair cost which could be for instance uh, in terms of um, flood um, as, as, a, as a result of erosion etc very intensive farming um, would be paid by the taxpayer. The repair cost is paid by the taxpayer. And, and I mean, there are several examples where we don't even have to talk about, you know, next generations and grandkids. It's happening as we speak, as if, if there is intensive uh, wheat production with no cover crops, intercropping, whatever. We have increasingly dry springs uh, interrupted by some heavy rains. We have 10, 20 tons of topsoil washed away um, all the time, which goes into rivers, canals, causing flooding. And then uh, the excavator who digs out the mud is actually paid by taxpayers. And that is maybe part of the tax, which is on a product, which uh, um, which sort of on organic products is not necessary because um, the organic producers already took care of the preventive action. So again, it's about transparency. There's also studies ongoing on, on, on communal level, on, on, on state level to actually quantify those costs and see how much is actually currently going into repair cost? How much more expensive should non-sustainable food be? And how much is built already in, in terms of preventive uh, costs into uh, sustainable food? 
So yeah, I, I think um, to do these studies, um, I think there's also study planned next year or so as part of the uh, the new regulations at EU level that would really help um, also as a guidance document for, for the actors in the supply chain. But yeah, transparency and uh, as I mentioned, um, disclosures of the externalities um, is a starting point and that could enable such an environment. Uh, thank you, Tobias. I don't know if Natalie or anyone else wants to also chip in uh, for this question. Maybe not for this one directly, but um, if if it's allowed for panelists also to uh, give questions, then I would uh, I would also ask one. Um, my uh, ideas as we were talking here is that we see that uh, it's a very complex system, and uh, member states really have to figure out and. Uh, and dedicate capacities how they could uh, foster the transition the most. And uh, as for example, for the um, first uh, pillar uh, ECHO scheme, uh, there were from IFAM EU and others also recommendations how member states can use it. Would it be possible uh, also maybe from the direction of the commission or together to create some kind of a guideline or uh, or um, uh, a toolbox, as Natalie mentioned, to uh, help a bit which tools could be uh, operatively used for member states to reach this transition. I'm thinking about advisory services, for example, for organic uh, as, as, a, as one key issue. Thank you. Natalie, it looks like the question was rather directed to you. Thank you yes. very much. Um, thank you. First, on the um, VAT, uh, I think it's an, it is an interesting uh, suggestion. We, we, we have discussion about it. You know that some member states, for instance, have tried to have uh, additional tax on what we consider like food that is not healthy. Uh, so there are some experiences on this and we are uh, let's say very preliminary reflecting on this but this would definitely require the support of member states in the field of VAT and that's quite uh, complex I know there were discussion going on uh, on the VAT and I have not seen that it was taken up uh, by a member state but it is a uh, indeed a tool that we are often uh, yeah we often face a suggestion to look a little bit more at VAT in a way to promote a change of uh, diet but that would require first of all a lot of reflection from our side and I say based on experience whether it is the right uh, it provides the right incentives uh, you also have to look at all the promotion you know you have in supermarket on certain type of food which are a little bit uh, different uh, impact as well um, on the eco scheme I, I prefer to be honest this is really a territory of DG Agri <laughs> I am not some they are, they are at the moment that you know very well in the process of final, finalizing the difficult negotiation on the CAP uh, I, I raise this new eco scheme which is in the current proposal which is very much discussed as you know which offer a, a new stream of funding to boost all sustainable practices um, the logic is that member states must identify the act activities to be supported on the basis of needs and priorities. And there was uh, a list of potential agriculture practices, you know, which uh, include, by the way, uh, organic farming practices. But more than that, I will not really get into telling whether they intend to go much further into developing further guidelines. I think it is best that I, maybe I I'll, will I'll ask them and come back to you on that. Yes, thank you. Uh, we understand that the um Dossiers are, are quite different from TG Agri and, and DG Sante. Um, okay, so with this, we wrap up the Q&A session, but the panel session is really not over yet. I would like now from here a bit from uh, to hear a bit from you, the, the audience, with a poll that we've prepared, a Slido poll, which I hope will be shown very soon. The Slido poll is actually about um, 
the about how much you learned about whether you have a clear idea of how to transition towards more sustainable food systems as a result of this session. And I hope you'll be able to see it in the uh, Slido um, uh, in the Slido icon on the right of your uh, of the live stream. And I want to finish this session by still giving um, about a minute uh, to each of our speakers to really give us their concluding words. And um, what I'd like for you to do, uh, speakers, is to complete the following sentence. If there is one thing we should take home from your intervention of today, it should be dot, dot, dot. And um, I will ask first to, to Fustin, we'll change a bit the order, so to fly. Uh, sure, yes. Uh, but I wanted, I saw one question which I, I just wanted to jump on. I'm going to be super quick, but there was a question on the competition law and whether uh, this is a, an obstacle to uh, uh, sustainability in pro public procurement. That's certainly something that we have also stressed and, and you know, within our proposal for having something more coherent than that food plan and cap plan, it's also important to make sure that the competition law is in line with the Green Deal objectives and that it doesn't block any sustainability requirements in public procurement. Um, conclusion. Uh, as I said, the magnitude of the challenge is huge and the time to act is very short. The status quo is really not an option. The Green Deal and in particular the Farm to Four that we have discussed today and its transformative uh, agenda has strong potential, but its impact relies pretty much on the member states' willingness to make it work or not. And we should really not undermine how big you know that change in mindset will be it's very important to to to, to work with them to work with all the the the, the relevant actors uh, uh, in the change in the in the chain sorry and also not to forget that the transition will also have to be fair and just and that it's important to identify you know who will lose out of it or, and who will win out of it in order to make sure that we you know we have everyone uh, uh, after the you know for the transition otherwise it's going to be extremely difficult yes i think we can uh, very much agree on that um dora would you like to give us your final words in about a minute yes thank you very much well i would conclude that we always say that organic uh, needs system thinking uh, that means uh, also that we have to have information, have knowledge uh, to be successful in organic farming in a different areas and apply them in a well-structured way. This is also true for sustainable food systems that uh, it, it, uh, it is complex. And to this level comes now how to operationalize with the toolbox, with the tools of the CUP uh, and beside the CUP other incentives, this uh, policy change and the realization of the turn to organic and to sustainable food systems, which is again something which needs system thinking. So uh, I totally agree that everybody needs to be involved, everybody needs to have their mindset, uh, including this system thinking, which is a challenge. Uh, we know that human resources changing uh, human mindsets is uh, actually the biggest challenge <laughs> ahead of us. And uh, I hope that we can contribute on the level of IFM Organics Europe as well to make this successfully achieved. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dora. And Tobias, on to you for your concluding words. Yeah, I uh, had as a first uh, point also the system thinking, uh, include consumers, uh, everybody, but that has been said already. So I think, um, yeah, I really would like to um, to strengthen, um, yeah, this, uh, this uh, let, let's use this new allies from the financial sector. Um, and of course, we usually consider them like the bad guys um, because they're only profit driven, et cetera. But um, it's 2021, we have one decade, uh, decade left um, and uh, maybe it's okay to use dollars and, and euro signs as a door opener to ac accelerate transition. And I think as organic is at its core the right thing to do it's not just you know something somebody thought of and said okay let's let's make a new label in the market but it, it at its core it's the right thing to do so there is also a economic reality to it and if we use that more to show it's actually the 
economically more viable option, then we can really move forward. And in this whole discussion with science and true cost, etc., we keep uh, discussing, you know, where we where we differ, but uh, in terms of approaches and models. But if you are if we are honest to each other, we actually have way more in common than what uh, differentiates each other. So let's focus on what we have in common and do it. Very inspiring and strong words. Thank you, Tobias. Um, Natalie, over to you. Mary, I am not sure where we'll be as inspiring. I think we we all know that the transition to sustainable food system will be difficult. It will be disruptive. And disruptive is, as I think Noah said, sometimes to mean changing mindset will be difficult as well. But it is absolutely necessary. So we do hope that we can succeed, but to succeed, we need the engagement of all, I say all actors of the food chain, from producer to consumers, but also all actors who contribute to the food chain. And it is true that the financial services, and uh, because we need to attract investment to sustainable uh, food system as well, um, so the engagement and the positive engagement of all is necessary. And this is why we really hope to develop this transition in a very um, inclusive process with all stakeholders and we are really here also to to listen and to you know welcome your idea and suggestion thank you very much natalie i think you can definitely uh, count on our engagement and hopefully on the engagement of everyone that listened in uh, today so i would like to thank you very much the speakers for your interesting thoughts um and also the participants for being here and for your attention and for replying to the Slido poll, which we'll see the results of um, soon. Great, they're coming on. Ah, well, that's, that's great to see. So um, many of you have a much better idea of what sustainable food systems means and how, how to get there. Um, and many of you also had quite extensive knowledge already but deep in your knowledge as a result of this session which is uh, great I'm, I'm pleased to see that so um just now uh so i gave the results of, of the poll and um now i would just like to uh tell you that the european organic congress is not over uh, we had yesterday we had two sessions today and we still have a couple of sessions tomorrow so at 10, we will start with a panel discussion about the new organic regulation. What will change? As you might know, the new organic regulation will come into force at the beginning of next year. So this is really a timely topic. At 11.15, uh, we will have a session on rural development and particularly on the long-term vision of rural areas. And finally, we will have a wrap up and closing words from our president, Jan Plage, that you also saw at the beginning yesterday, and from the Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, Janos Wojciechowski. And with this uh, interesting program of tomorrow, I would like to uh, leave you. Thank you all again, and have a very lovely afternoon and potentially lunch too. Thank you.